Thank you, John. Thank you, and welcome everybody. Um, engineering design is really at the heart of everything that London 2012 is about. Engineers playing a role in planning, designing, and enabling the venues and infrastructure that will form the legacy that we've created at the back of London 2012, a legacy for London, and a legacy for those that live in London. To help you understand the last five years of Atkins involvement and most people's involvement, we have a short little video here that will explain to you and some highlight some of the complexity of the challenges we face as engineers on the 2012. The International Olympic Committee.
Thank you, Jeffrey. That has been my connection presentation. Our site, many different projects going on. Could you just say a little more about how the whole thing has actually come together? You've had so many different contractors working on it, so many people doing so many different jobs and demolition, the tunnel, doing So, what basically was the overall mechanism that you ran right at the very top in order to be sure people had proper access, health and safety was being observed, and everything was moving in a way that didn't mean that anyone in the group was getting in the way of others? I guess, the yeah, I'll answer that on John's behalf, I think. I mean, the, the structure from day one, in about um, January 06, the ODA decided it would be a delivery partner rather than a project manager for this programme. And that delivery partner was charged with integration in the broadest sense between design and construction, between construction and construction logistics. Um, things like having a park health on the site, in the middle of the site, that optimise the amount of time at the working phase for our construction employees. Having common areas, common access between the contractors, whilst maintaining each parcel of land from a health and safety stroke regulatory pur purpose. So the delivery partner playing an overall um, role in management of the programme, managing within the um, projects that come from DCMS, the budgets, but integrating, working really hard to integrate across both design and construction and then within the programme, taking a proactive role with a logistics team to not fetch and carry, but almost to manage those interfaces to a collaborative or common resolution, I would suggest. So delivery partner is key, delivery partner key, and delivery partner with a hands-on management role around the logistics and the interfaces between the various projects. 300 parcels of land, potentially 300 different contractors. All work you know, we have on site, site transport provided by our logistics, there's road maintenance provided by our logistics, waste management provided by our logistics, common health and safety standards, the contractors have worked very hard to change some of their policies such that everybody was at the same level looking the same way. Blue hats are on, on site for supervisors. Real, real, right down into the detail, but, you know, strategy, plans, but then detail, really. Making sure that all those were managed well through. So I think, John, you are the delivery partners key, and delivery partner in the field stage, really, really critical. Big learning for me to see how that works. Yeah, park health is the one I've never, in my wildest dreams, thought about park health in planning this job. Really small thing. Does that help? Very good. Thank you, uh, Chris Fleming from the Government Office for Science. I was wondering about the change in mayor in 2008 and whether that had any effect on the project. Gosh, you're asking me John Armour questions here. From my perspective, no. As an engineering profession, not at all. Uh, the standards of sustainability, diversity, health, and safety, I think. That were suggested to the project, but the projects owned them. That's that's what affects us. You know. Budget control, delivering time and cost and program, all those things are values. The one team, one vision. This vision set by the ODA with their guiding principles. We all bought into it. It's the Olympics. We wanted to be part of the team. So, virtually impossible to derail the project. I would suggest. John, would you agree? It's too important. It's personal. Yeah. We, we have, we, we're charged with a legacy for the UK construction industry. That's what we feel, working on the job. We, we've been granted a real honour to be on this programme. We don't want to be derailed. Conformance to the UCL. Um, at, at the end of the day, the infrastructure has to map onto the activities of the athletes and the commentators and yep. the various visitors and what have you. Which, and you conjure up a picture, at least John conjured up a picture of lots of people, lots of movement. And I just wonder if you could say something about the original design and how that was put together as a system which enabled that degree of movement and that degree of operation to go on and how that led to the actual physical elements in the design. Bill, are you going to touch on this later? Yeah, I can. I, can. I think it might be best for Bill when he's looking at the overall master planning of the park and connectivity and how the modelling of athletes at games fight. I think if you start with operating of the games and the, then the event schedule and the people movements and then Hughes transport delivery of people to the games, from a science perspective that starts setting um, 
corridor widths, bridge widths, all this sort of thing. The disposition of the facilities, uh, to some degree, driven by where the venues needed to be in legacy, what was the sustainable legacy, where would they go? Once you start putting those things in place, and the concept of improving connectivity across the Rivoli, taking the four London boroughs hinterland and making it central to something, that starts dealing with transport and connectivity and all those sort of things. Driven by a master plan vision of connecting four London boroughs to create one central hub around the transport interchange. She will no doubt touch on that more. He's been involved in longer than myself. And Bill will from a, uh, an infrastructure perspective. I'm sorry to be diverse, but I don't want to steal Bill's thunder to be honest with you. David Anderson, uh, Warwick University. I, I just wonder whether you'd like to comment on the challenge of uh, obtaining an appropriate number of uh, qualified personnel at all levels in order to deliver the project. Um, I think I was talking to someone earlier about um, on site this morning with business in the community. They say the food industry is not very sexy. This is probably the sexiest project you could have in the construction industry. And we've never had a problem of pulling people towards it. People have knocked on our door saying, can I be involved, please, in London 2012. The gentleman behind you, Mike Vaughan, came up from Bristol because this, to him, the wetlands of London 2012, was the pinnacle of a professional career. We've not had problems. We've, um, we've co-located people from across the globe to work on the job. It's not really been an issue. We thought it might be at the time. You know, one of our, our strap lines in our presentation to the LDA as well as then, we have the resources, 2,000 people within 20 miles of London. We haven't found it a problem, really. Um, Bill, you might, you might say the same. We found people with the right skills, with the right behaviours. But I think that to deal with the challenges, we've had to have people to really bring their skills to the table bring what they've learned and through collaboration learn real time. So the, the learning from the collaborative team about you know, learning what you're doing, not the end of the project, but each and every day and sharing it across the whole team. I think that's been really good building <coughs> the collaboration between, on the face of it, two competing companies, Atkins and Arab, the two biggest consultants in the UK, I would suggest. Um, but collaborating together with one goal, one plan, one vision. So not a big issue for us, to be honest much as we thought it would be. Tell me much. With the length of this project, the complexity, the all the interfaces, could you say something about how you managed, and I was all identified, you managed the risks during the design process? Yeah, now into the detail here. Um, what we, we um, through CLM, we have formal risk assessment processes. Um, we adopt them right the way through the Atkins team. We decided that we'd flex our internal processes to suit the ODA's natural processes. So we have commonality across uh, the whole program. We look at health and safety risk, environmental risk, technical risk. We contribute to the definition of program list from a cost time and quality. So that's all integrated into one, I suggest, John, large risk plan that probably ends up at David Higgins' desk, to be honest with you. So it's, it's the cascade through and the commonality of systems and procedures, language and lexicon, that allow us all to collaborate in the same way. And to, all, to try and approach the same issue in a common way through the delivery partner. So the delivery partner, again, has helped to create consistency and, and sort of take some people naturally, ecologists, archaeologists, may not be used to some of these earned value tools and cost performance index, schedule performance index, but in working in collaborative teams, well, someone over there has done that job for them. So again, spreading the sort of by osmosis, the, the good project principles into the broader team, into scientists, into creative people, it's been a real success. We find it's more in people's DNA. Okay, thank you very much, John. Um, is everybody happy about being able to see the slide? I think that's an improvement turning the lights off. Um, just to um, reiterate one of the points that was made uh, before um, uh, about the sizes of the, uh, the teams and the, um, uh, and, and the ease with which we managed to recruit people into the team, I also had to build up a team of 450 people. Uh, and you'll remember that um, uh, in, in uh, 2007, 2008, we were in boom time. Uh, and it wasn't always easy to get people to work on, on projects, but uh, we had no problem getting people to work on this project. It really is one of the, uh, 
uh, one of the iconic and, uh, and one of the best projects that, uh, that we've ever had. So my presentation is about creating strong infrastructure uh, that's required for the event. Um, I, I want to run through um, uh, very briefly something about the ODA vision, something about the history of the games, designing for games and legacy, um, and current design, um, a bit about utilities and sustainability, which has already been mentioned, I know, um, bridges and building a new community. Very briefly, I don't expect to be able to read all these words, but this is, this is the ODA's vision. I just want to pick up um, some themes there about games and legacy, um, on time and to budget and to specification, and regeneration and sustainable development in, in East London. Um, for the ODA, this uh, went on from the vision to, to the mission, which um, I can leave you to read while I'm speaking. Um, the three overarching themes from, uh, of the ODA uh, are about time, cost and fitness for purpose, and uh, further priority themes, which are phrases that you will hear as we go through health and safety and security, sustainability, quality and diversity, legacy and design and accessibility. And I think all of those uh, are words that you will hear uh, in the language uh, of this project. Um, also want to talk about um, some of the uh, challenges that we faced in, in what was a very, very ambitious programme. Um, Strapline is twice the spend of Terminal 5 in half the time. Um, and I also want to be telling you, um, in terms of legacy, what we hope to leave behind after the Games. Um, but first of all, I wanted to just reflect on what we've learned from, from the history of, of um, previous Olympic parks. Um, in 1896, um, the Games were held in, in Athens. Um, this is the elongated U-shape of the uh, Path Path Panathinaiko Stadium in Athens. This was originally constructed in 330 BC, so it'd be hard to top that as a legacy proposition. Um, <laughs> so that's lasted a long time. Everything was gathered together for these games, wrestling, gymnastics, etc., all in one stadium. There were no separate venues uh, then at the first um, modern Olympics. Swimming was held in the Bay of Zia off the Piraeus coast in, in open waters. But let's start off perhaps looking at why a city wants to host the Olympics. Cities want to be on top and um, best their rivals. Cities claim to be um, the best cities in the world. Uh, this is a, um, a, an excerpt from a 2007 poll uh, on the best global city. It was published by The Independent. Uh, and you can see that the top race there is between New York and London. London beating New York because we'd held the Olympic Games um, twice. And now, of course, we'll, we'll uh, be beating New York um, after 2012, um, after ha ha holding the Games three times here. So, um, this is about sending out a message that, that um, we're living in um, the, the first world city. London wants to stay relevant. Uh, Beijing, um, through its opening ceremony and the closing ceremony, wanted to send out the message that they are more relevant than people realise. Um, 2004, Athens, about um, re-establishing their relevance. So it's all about um, uh, the, the quest for, uh, for city global relevance. This is um, a picture of Pierre de Corbetin, who in 1896 um, really started the modern Olympics. He, he wanted to revitalise uh, the Olympic Games. He, he befriended uh, a chap called William Penny Brooks, who um, uh, had caused quite some... Um, humour, I think, in the, in the UK uh, at the time for uh, holding what he called the Much Wenlock Games, which included games like uh, chin kicking. Um, and, um, uh, and together, uh, they put together the original proposition for, um, for the original um, uh, modern Olympics. So de Corbetin arranged a conference in 1894 with various other uh, European countries, uh, formed the IOC in that time. Uh, and set a date and location for the first modern Olympics. They um, appropriately elected uh, Athens. Oh, sorry, that's going on. Um, and then prepared an estimate of the anticipated costs. Uh, they also discussed whether or not it should be held in Athens in perpetuity or moved on. Uh, and the agreement was that it would be moved from one country to the next. Uh, in terms of cost, the estimate for the 1896 Games in Athens, um, the budget was set at the conference uh, and was about a third of what was needed. So controversy about um, 
games costs absolutely from the start. This is a picture of Paris in 1900. Um, and the games were staged as, a compl uh, as complementary to the World Fair. The games that took place there included firefighting, cannon shooting and live pigeon shooting. Uh, problems for the field and track events uh, were that they hadn't adequately cleared the land. Athletes had to dodge one another and obstacles. Swimming events were held uh, in the same. Um, in 1904, um, uh, the games were held in uh, St. Louis. Chicago had offered um, to house those games, but that coincided with the World Fair in St. Louis. So the president of the USA at the time intervened and the games were moved uh, to there. Um, Tug of War was quite big at that time uh, and, was, and has actually been one of the most enduring Olympic Games. Um, there were first signs of uh, problems of not attending to the athletes. Um, and, um, and I quote here from the 1904 Olympics report, there were other conditions that were opposed to fast time. There was but one place along the road, this is talking about a road running race, after leaving the stadium where the athletes could secure fresh water and that place was 12 miles from the start the water being secured from a well. The visiting athletes were not accustomed to the water and as a consequence many suffered from intestinal disorders. All these matters may appear of minor importance to the uninitiated but to the athlete they are mountain-like causes of injury. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more later about how important um, uh, it is that the venues uh, and the whole games uh, work perfectly well. Um, uh, and again that's another article uh, about um, about the conditions, the course of the sprints was wet and soggy, the hammer throwing was impeded by trees. Um, in 1908, Rome won the uh, Olympic Games, um, but they had uh, a number of concerns, um, the principal one of which was that um, in 1906, Mount Vesuvius erupted, uh, and they had uh, then an emergency recovery situation on their hands. The government said they were unable to manage the recovery of that, uh, and at the same time finance the infrastructure of the Games, so they gave the bid back the Olympic Games to the IOC and at short notice London offered to stage the Games in 1908. Uh, we linked them with the Franco-British Exhibition which was to be held in White City. Uh, this is a, a, a modern picture of the site, of course, the White City Stadium having been demolished. <coughs> Interestingly, as an aside, there's only been two Olympic stadiums that have been demolished to, uh, uh, in the modern Olympics and both of those have been in London. Um, uh, Wembley Stadium and, uh, and, and White City. All the, all the others remain standing. Um, so, um, okay, so, so that's of the, uh, uh, you see, see the picture there in the top left, which is the uh, White City Stadium. So, uh, London is the first Games to have got a purpose-built stadium. Um, we negotiate with the British Franco exhibition in exchange for 75% of the gate receipts. It's agreed that the first purpose-built Olympic Stadium is built. Uh, capacity of 80,000 people, no similar structure existed anywhere in the world at the time. Swimming was in a temporary pool, unheated and unfiltered, but offering the most regulated conditions to date. If the question of finance has proved difficult in the past, that difficulty is not likely to diminish in the future, for Olympic balance sheets, like other budgets, are in the habit of proving their healthy existence by a vigorous growth. 1908, <laughs> Olympics report. <laughs> Nothing much changes. This is uh, the site uh, at that time. Um, de Corbetan says it would be unfortunate if the often exaggerated expenses incurred for the most recent Olympiads, a sizable part of which represented the construction of permanent buildings, were moreover unnecessary. Temporary structures would fully suffice, uh, and the only consequence is to then encourage use of these permanent buildings by increasing the number of occasions to draw in the crowds, etc., etc., etc. And I refer back to that in a minute. This table um, shows. Um, the uh, land utilisation after the, the Olympic Games. Um, we can see what different games have done with regard to their facilities, uh, and you can see that, that, that different countries have done uh, different things uh, with, uh, with their park. This is uh, Sebastian Cohen, 2005, said, I think our Olympic park is next generation thinking. We want to use sports as part of the regeneration process. On the other hand, um, uh, a professor uh, in the USA says the Olympics is a temporary thing. It's like a rocket that shoots up in the sky, a big expensive rocket, and then it's gone. Maybe the best thing is to forget about the Olympics and go about the business of becoming a first class city. So you can see a very different uh, ideology uh, from different people. So uh, the challenge for us, the, 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 
The real challenge for us uh, is, to, is to make that uh, regeneration process and that legacy a success. So I just want to talk a little bit about games and legacy. Uh, here are some facts and figures. Um, very fortunately, most of them are the same as the numbers that, uh, that John gave out earlier. Um, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll move on from that. The important thing um, is that there is these widely contrasting demands between designing something for games and designing something for legacy. For games, the athletes have got to work perfectly for two weeks that they're there, and especially when they step up for their event. For non-athletes, very difficult to understand the focus and effort that has brought Olympians to the blocks, the pain, endurance, sacrifice necessary to be world class, and we really owe it to them to ensure that they've got the best possible chance of winning gold. So the infrastructure has to work for a specific short point in time, um, and that's when it needs to work. For the people of Stratford, however, it's got to work in the long term, societal and environmental improvements that are desperately needed in the area and a lasting regeneration of an area which is the size of the City of London. The area, um, as you will have heard, is one of the most deprived in the country in terms of health, wealth and unemployment. So meeting the requirements of both games and legacy within the time and cost limits has been uh, the challenge. So this is um, the site in games mode. I think the map on the left is similar uh, essentially to the one that, uh, that you have in your pack uh, and some visualisations on the right of how it might look. Then, in, then we move to the legacy mode and if I just switch backwards and forwards between games and legacy you can see how the site becomes greener and the temporary venues disappear and um, it's about the conversion of, um, uh, of the games park um, with the wide bridges and I refer to that, might refer to that, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, uh, through to the legacy position with, with the park, with housing um, and other um, uh, occupation of the land. So, to take the site from this, which you've already seen in the video, to uh, uh, our uh, vision, which is, which is something like this. One of the design aspects has been the ease of transition, converting from games to legacy and making sure that we understand when we design for games and we design for legacy, that we understand how difficult or make it, how easy we can make it to transition from, uh, from the game situation to the legacy trans, uh, situation. I wanted to talk a bit about concurrent design and planning, but I think time is going to be against me. So all I wanted to say about um, construction, uh, about concurrent planning and design, was the challenges that we faced in designing all of the elements of this park, all at the same time, all concurrently, buying in stakeholders at the same time as doing the planning, at the same time as doing the remediation, at the same time as carrying out the design. Um, was, was a great challenge and you don't achieve that if everybody is at logheads with each other. The only way to do that, as Mike was referred to before, is do it as a team. Um, there's no time to fall out with everybody. You really do have to just roll your sleeves up and get on with the job. Uh, and that's been one of the delights of working on this, on this project, has been, has been that sort of, uh, that sort of um, uh, push. Let me move on quickly to uh, sustainability uh, and utilities. Sustainability is very important. Um, these are the headline uh, targets um, that ODA are aiming at. Uh, I just want to give you one example now of the uh, non-potable water supply. The ODA's target was 40% reduction in the use of potable water on the park. 30% was achieved through water efficient devices in, in, in venues uh, and elsewhere. But the non-potable water supply network provided a further 10% reduction. Um, in the um, use of potable network uh, on, on the Olympic Park. So the um, picture on the left is just a plan of, uh, of, of where the principal um, uh, lines run for the non-potable supply. This collects um, what we call black water, which I hope I don't need to explain, from the northern outfall sewer, so treats it in a very sophisticated manner and stores it and uses it for non-potable needs. So flushing, irrigation, all the toilets and venues, the public realm irrigation, um, uh, flushing of uh, sewers and so on. And um, this is uh, a legacy installation, Thames Water um, uh, are involved in, in that. This is um, uh, a diagram of, uh, of some of the utility networks, it's a South Park featured on, on the left hand side there. 10 kilometres of telecoms, 5 kilometres of electrical um, high voltage and lighting networks, I, I won't read out um, the whole list, uh, but there's a very, very intensive 
uh, distribution of, of utilities around the site. One of the first pieces of utility uh, that we uh, that we worked on was the rerouting of the two major transition uh, transmission lines. Sorry, from Hackney to West Ham, and the picture down here uh, shows the pylons. But this is the route of the overhead uh, pylons, which clearly had to go. Uh, this was the first piece of major work. Two tunnels were constructed pretty well along the same alignment as um, uh, as the pylons, uh, tunnel boring machine, and and um, high voltage cables installed. All of that work. Uh, was done um, uh, underground obviously, two six kilometre tunnels, one 4.1 diameter, one 2.8 metres diameter, finished in December 2009. Uh, very successful um, opening uh, ceremony with uh, uh, Tessa Jowell in attendance. And here is the uh, pylons coming down, you've already seen a picture of that uh, in the video. Moving on very quickly to, to the energy strategy. Uh, this is driven by the London Plan um, and legislation. Uh, the London Plan um, is, is planning legislation, applies to post games, 20% renewable energy target, um, and the 50% carbon reduction target that you can see there um, is uh, essentially a section 106 agreement, um, which, um, which one is making best endeavours to meet. This is the... Um, uh, power uh, demand, which we were uh, working to on uh, on the utility network. This is this is uh, part one of ODA's um, uh, innovative uh, approaches uh, to the project. This is a strategy for delivering the new utility and energy infrastructure in coordination with the Stratford City development. Um, so uh, this is this is this is the power uh, demand, and, and essentially uh, this is the games and, and this is post games. And so the proposition is to get um, a private utility company to install all of the utilities in this time here to provide the peak power for the games here and then they recoup their investment um, by selling the uh, power, uh, selling the energy uh, in, in this period here. And that has, um, uh, that has worked uh, successfully. The proposition was to invite private sector to deliver, own, operate um, this utility infrastructure and, uh, and that is now installed. Um, the community energy strategy involved getting together, as I've said, with um, um, the Olympic Village, the Stratford uh, city areas um, uh, and, and, and that is also um, working now. Um, just got a few pictures of some of the uh, utility buildings. There's actually a large number of utility buildings across this uh, across this site. These are uh, this is the energy centre, um, and this is the Kings Yard area. The energy centre is on the uh, left as you're looking at it, and the uh, substation is on the right. Uh, the primary sub was the first building to be completed, it won an RIBA award. That's a better photograph of it um, uh, after completion. Uh, but it's probably a bit dark now, the lights around. This is the, um, this is the primary uh, deep foul sewer system uh, pump house. Um, and, and this picture just prompts me to, to say that the aspiration was to make utility buildings look good. Um, we wanted to get very much to get away from the idea that utilities were housed in large grey structures, um, rectangular and boring. And, uh, uh, and this is one of the testimonies to, um, to that aspiration. The bridges, uh, just moving on into some of the detail, the bridges carry, um, in most cases, uh, the utilities across the rivers. You can see how the box girder beam has been used here uh, to put in utility pipes, and that is, that is absolutely um, uh, the case for, for most of the bridges. That then moves me on. That moves me on to, to talking about um, bridges um, and the connectivity of the park that gets created by, by the bridges. Um, when, when we first started, oh, sorry, step back. What you will notice about the park is that there are a number of waterways, the Lee uh, River, Navigation Canal and so on. There's all these waterways which have, uh, in the past, really divided up the land uh, masses, uh, as, you, as you can see. When we started, there were eight bridges in the Olympic Park area uh, connecting these pieces of land. 
Um, when we finish, there will be 22 bridges connecting those land uh, areas, and, and, and that is really important in order to achieve continuity, particularly from east to west and vice versa, um, uh, and, and also, of course, between uh, the various London boroughs. Um, the bridges are constructed in families of bridges, there's highway bridges, there's seven foot bridges, five underpasses, uh, and, uh, and so on. The bridge design concept. Uh, bridges were not designed, with the exception of one, one of the bridges on the park, bridges are not designed to be iconic, tall um, structures. Uh, they're not designed to, to be a uh, feature or signature bridges. They're really a continuation of the landscape. So there's no uh, structure above general ground level other than the parapets. They're designed to be elegant and efficient, Economy, using economies of scale, standard elements such as parapets, edge beams and uh, abutment finishes and I've got some pictures of those coming up in a minute. Um, the bridge abutments are all finished at 70 degrees. Uh, they're clad in reinforced baskets filled with Site 1 arisings and this refers back to something that Mike said earlier on. Uh, there's 2,700 tonnes of crushed concrete in, um, uh, in the um, bridge abutment uh, cladding baskets there. Um, all um, hand-packed at the front to make sure that you get this continuity and, uh, and consistency of, um, uh, of appearance. And you can see the further detail there. So the elegance of the bridges comes from um, attentions, attention to detailing. Uh, pedestrian bridges, um, I think that's a pedestrian bridge uh, featured there, and you can just see these pictures here of the um, simple style of bridge design, um, simple detailing, um, and, um, and, and, and and economy of scale really, because we used as many details as we could across um, uh, across as many bridges as we could. Um, Mike also referred to this as just about designing for games and legacy. Um, the pedestrian bridges, particularly the ones that access the Stadium Island, uh, are sized on pedestrian modelling. Um, so you can imagine that, that um, when the stadium um, empties, then you need a very wide bridge for large numbers of people. When you're modelling it as a park, you don't need anywhere near the same width, which is why um, uh, we elected to go for um, a large, wide temporary bridge uh, and a very uh, much thinner permanent bridge. And you've, you've seen these pictures before. Um, just in passing, while we, we are looking at the bridges, I just want to mention the incorporation of art because there's a significant attention to art in the park. Um, one element of that is the painting of the underside of bridge beams. This example that you can see here um, is um, uh, one of the bridges which has uh, actually got a, a road going underneath it. But um, the ones over the river are painted on the underside and you can see the colour reflecting in the water. Uh, and looks very, very attractive. And, and, and the colours that are used are the primary uh, Olympic colours. Just wanted to say one or two things about landscaping um, as I finish. Um, and um, the landscape engineering has really been one of the major um, uh, sustainability uh, stories. Um, I think we've had mentioned before that the North Park has got more, uh, has got an ecological emphasis. Um, it's got the wetlands. It's very green. The South Park is more of an urban emphasis, um, with an urban, new urban waterfront, uh, entertainment destinations, and uh, and of course now the uh, orbit. Um, and so some some typical detailing has been things like replacing retaining walls with with slopes. Uh, which reduces the capital cost and creates more usable um, park space. Rationalising the design to reduce the number of bespoke items, so things like seating, uh, walls, terraces, stairs and so on and so forth. Um, we've gone for repetitive construction uh, which leads itself to, lends itself to precast um, uh, concrete units. Um, then something about the um, uh, biodiversity, the landscape uh, significantly contributes to the biodiversity action plan targets um, and the concourse construction uses 50% uh, picture of the concourse there, uses 50% cold bitumen recycled asphalt as aggregate so um, there's 250 tonnes of CO2 um, saved there uh, in, the, in the concourse construction 
So just a few words about, um, about the Legacy uh, Master Plan. Two years ago, the Legacy Master Plan um, uh, started to be um, um, thought about uh, seriously, although Legacy was obviously uh, being thought about from the outset. Um, and with the ODA providing the operational foundation for the, for the Legacy development, so, so the inheritance for the Legacy uh, company coming from uh, what, uh, what ODA will leave behind, what will be left behind after the games, looking at the neighbourhood um, and communities around the outside, um, and, and, and here looking at the connections. Um, these, are, these connections up here are shown are just the sustainability mode connections, rail, um, pedestrian uh, and bicycle. The rail network has been um, uh, pretty well advanced so far. Um, buses are to follow and this is just a, a diagram bit of work in progress um, showing the um, connectivity and the integrated approach that's being taken by um, TfL and, and the developers working together. So, of course, there are other things that are going to be left on this park, um, and, and, and this is a picture of the, uh, of the orbit. So the story so far is one of success um, in planning and designing and building this new community uh, in which the Olympic Games of 2012 will be held and which are going to be fabulous um, and uh, we know records are going to be broken and I predict we're going to end up with uh, a record number of medals. But when the games uh, have gone, the park is designed um, to regenerate the social and built infrastructure of Stratford. This is a little bit of video that shows you how it might look uh, in games time. And you can see the, uh, the green um, parklands in the north. We're heading towards the south here. You can see the stadium. You can see the Aquatic Centre in Legacy here, City of London in the background. It's just a computer, uh, a computer model showing how, how it might look, um, well, hopefully how it will look, um, uh, during the games time. And to improve the lives of the people around it and to provide a lasting legacy. And as it looks last month, something like that. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, you know, I'm Stuart Fraser of Alpha BT and uh, Project Director for the Aquatic Centre. And, and if we may, I think I'd like to sort of set in context some of the work that Mike is in particular going to talk about shortly. Um, and then Mike will do his, do his bit around particularly the roof design and the challenges that that presented to both him as a designer and us as the contractors. And then perhaps wrap up at the end with just some up-to-date shots as to where we are. There we are. That tells you who we are. Right, um, again, putting it in context then, um, the Aquatic Centre, as was said earlier, um, sits in the southeast corner of the Olympic Park. Um, it is actually sitting also between two quite massive footbridges, one of which is temporary, uh, which actually will then create the link from uh, Stratford City and the hub of tra uh, and the Stratford hub, of trans Stratford Transport Hub, about which I'm sure Hugh will talk more later, uh, such that largely some quarter of a million pound, uh, quarter of a million spectators per day, I'm told, will probably enter the site from that spot. So it's going to be the primary location and primary entry point for the for the park during games time. <coughs> Our venue will be the first that you see as you go into the park, and of course you'll be immediately confronted in front of you by the main <coughs> stadium, which is the west of the Aquatic Centre. And that, um, although that's the focal point for the opening and closing ceremonies, <coughs> and indeed for the track and field events, it's the Aquatic Centre as you'll expect me to say, which is the really uh, the most iconic venue from a design perspective and I think also the most widely used during games. <coughs> I've got to talk today already about legacy, which I've been listening to, and of course the Aquatic Centre has a capacity during games, which is required, of 18,000. There's not much um, hunger for an 18,000 Aquatic uh, Stadium or venue beyond games. The Olympics is the only time that you'd need that sort of capacity. So we've designed uh, essentially the uh, Aquatics venue for legacy, and we're converting it for games in a manner that Mike will describe very shortly. There's more than the roof structure, which is the challenge, in from an engineering perspective. And I guess there are four or five others. First of all, as already been said, the remediation of the site um, from its very former use pre-war through to its use in the 50s and beyond um, has actually obviously been described this afternoon and in itself was somewhat of a challenge. 
it's actually not remembered perhaps by many, but Stratford was actually a big railway town also, and it was a manufacture, manufacturing facility for railway locomotives and carriages right the way through to the 50s. Secondly, beyond that, um, and that is the remediator site that we inherited in June 2008, um, much of our work is carried out below the water table. Uh, Bill mentioned two tunnels that run immediately beneath our site, um, some 20 or metres down below ground, and those of you with sharp sight will see the head houses for each of those two tunnels um, to the left and to the right, and they converge to the north of the park, but they, they run under the site of the aquatic centre, and indeed the one to the east sits immediately underneath the core that supports the roof. The third challenge was that, um, therefore, much of our work had to be carried out um, below the water table, and to deal essentially with those two tunnels and the transfer slabs and pile caps that were necessary. And then the third challenge, or the fourth challenge, was the existence of the alluvium, which you might imagine existed in such a club plain in this part of London. And much of that alluvium had to be removed, not only to deal with the permanent requirements, permanent structural design requirements, but also to deal with the um, formation of piling mats and crane platforms that we needed to create to carry out the piling and the excavations below ground. But the biggest engineering challenge of all, of course, was the roof. And the um, shape, and the iconic design, designed by Zaha Hadid, uh, presented Mike with challenges, presented us with challenges in terms of construction. And the next piece of this presentation is about how we, together with our, and our, and our other colleagues within the uh, engineering and, and design and construction team, delivered that roof. So I'll ask Mike to take us through that, and I'll come back at the end and perhaps just sum up on a couple of points. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Um, just to, what's the, here we go. Yeah, this uh, just is an overview of the legacy building uh, taken from our 3D models in an exploded view. Um, the, uh, these are actually our uh, um, documentation tools, so uh, these are all from our Revit model and the services of which are not really complete in that view are all from our um, CAD duct. So it's, it's a, a documentation tool, but then we've used them for our visualizations as well. So this is in the legacy mode, and the exploded view up here showing the, uh, the roof itself, legacy roof, timber lining, um, some walkways up within the roof for access of the lights and equipment, etc., facade, and then the uh, substructure. Now, to go through a little of the history, how we got to this point, uh, the last slide shows what's under construction at the moment. This is the competition winning entry. So it was a competition for the design at the end of uh, 2004 was when it was won. Those sharp-eyed with dates will realise that's actually before the Games were won for uh, London. So London was bidding for the 2012 Olympics at the time. Uh, this was a central component of the bid to show the IOC that London was serious about the Olympics and was going to, to invest in, in cutting-edge uh, architecture to, to hold the, the, um, the Games here. So, you can see there's the Olympic mode at the top, legacy mode at the bottom. Um, not much difference between the two when you look at them. Um, it's just some structural diagrams about how we were proposing to create that with uh, arch structures. But you can see in the Olympic mode for the competition winning entry, it was uh, a case of tucking all the temporary seating underneath the roof. And after the Olympics, having a, um, a new facade installed on either side, well back from the edge. So that was, uh, that was what was presented to the IOC, and that's what the scheme was when London won the uh, Olympics in the summer of uh, 2005. So once we won the, uh, the Games, we went back and, and had a look at, at what was, was sensible in terms of where the focus should be. And there was a very clear steer from the ODA and their delivery partner that the steer should be towards uh, legacy. and to, to look at how you then adapt it to uh, Olympics, which is what Stuart was alluding to as well. So you can see here in, um, in April 2007, this was our original stage C scheme, um, the difference between what you actually see in the Olympic mode, where there's temporary seating here and a temporary roof on either side, and the legacy mode um, is more striking. We've reduced the area of the, the roof in the, the legacy mode so that you could actually see there's not massive overhangs um, that you end up seeing for the rest of the existence of the building that, that there was something there before. 
So that was one of the key issues there. And, but you can see there was a shaping of the legacy, uh, sorry, the um, Olympic seating to, to be um, in harmony with the rest of the building. We, working through that, uh, both in terms of uh, cost, complexity, etc., there was a clear steer to say, okay, let's, we have to reduce area, reduce volume, and focus even more on legacy. But, sorry, just before we got to that point, this is, this is stage C. So this is the, um, the scheme or the concept as it was in April 2007. We worked up that in consider considerable detail. Um, one of the areas that everyone focused a great deal on was the roof because um, in terms of the, uh, the construction program and, um, and what was most critical in the program was making sure that the roof could be built and built on time. So at that stage we looked at two very large primary arches on either side and then spanning um, secondary structure in between. Um, at the time it was proposed in steel, it could have been done in timber as well. One of the key issues here was all of the temporary seating on the side and the covering to the temporary seating rested on the edge of the, uh, the legacy roof. That was possible because we had these two large uh, primary inclined arches on either side. The downside to that was that uh, because it was a, two very large arches, they have huge thrusts towards the ground and we had a, um, a tie buried within the ground in the uh, substructure to deal with that thrust. Now, one thing I think the ODA and CLM did very cleverly in, in terms of uh, how these projects were run was, remember, this was uh, early 2007, so um, in the industry, everyone was busy, everyone was uh, building things and, um, and doing quite well. So there was, a, I think, a concern, a very clear concern, that people or contractors may see this as a high-risk project, that you, why would you want to be doing these when you you know, making plenty of money working on uh, multi-storey buildings elsewhere. So one of the key things was, was removing risk or reducing risk and, and reducing the percep perception of risk. So the ODA and the delivery partner um, created a, a, a series of um, consult uh, consultations with the industry, a competitive dialogue process where the design team would sit down with potential contractors and go through the design and walk through it and get feedback, um, as well as, as, I think, instill confidence um, in the contractors that, that it was a buildable scheme. So through that process, it was a two-way um, information exchange. And from that, uh, one of the things that we, we got very strongly from that was that this, uh, there was a perception that, that this was going to be quite a complicated structure, also inclined um, arch structures here in concrete um, in terms of building it, that although it was quite efficient, quite efficient in terms of the material usage in the roof, that uh, there was a complexity um, in, in how you actually put that together on site and, and perhaps something that was a little more risky in terms of programming. So the design team took that away, um, worked over uh, another three or four months to, to, um, to take on board those comments from the contractors and, and work that into the design. Uh, at the same time, the, uh, the temporary stands uh, for the Olympics were, were reduced and, and made more rational in terms of their, uh, their scale and their construction. So instead of having something curved and, and more integrated with the form of a legacy building, we, we created something that was an orthogonal grid, which has allowed us to have a repetitive uh, system, both in terms of the seating in the terraces that sit on the structure and the structure itself. So there was a very, very strong drive towards simplifying this as much as possible and, and focusing very much on the legacy building. And you can see that very much in these images. Uh, it probably didn't go down too well with some of the architectural press, but I think for most people, the, they understand that this is a legacy building and it is only in this mode um, for the matter of uh, the Olympics and the, um, and the Paralympics. So to be sensible about how you structure the building and where you invest um, in the building, then this is the best approach to take. So this is the scheme we, we developed from that point onwards. Um, taking on board the, uh, the comments from the potential contractors at the time was that we totally reconfigured the, the way the roof works and as it was seen as one of the high-risk 
item is probably the biggest risk item in terms of uh, program and complexity. We took on board uh, the comments from the potential contractors and we simplified it. We created a structure that was all 2D trusses. You can see one of these slices here is one of these fan elements here. Uh, just to give a, an, an overall idea of scale, from the southern support here on this wall to the tip is 160 metres. The width from one side to the other is 90 metres. And the span, the clear span from uh, the supports on the core to the southern wall is 120 metres. This support here on the two outermost bearings is only 22 metres wide. So you can imagine, even if you're rocking that as a small model, you can see it was quite a challenging process to get this, this shape to work um, in, an, in an efficient structure that was buildable. So as I say, we, we created two D elements. All of these trusses are fabricated steel plate, constant sizes so that all the nodes are um, as simplified as much as possible so that when you have all these elements coming in in a 2D plane that you make the connections as simple and, and easy to put together as possible. Um, the areas of greatest complexity, I suppose, are these wing areas because they hang well beyond the, uh, the supports. If you draw a line from here to the support here, you've got it around a 27 metre overhang um, from your last line of support, bang in the middle of a 120 metre span. So I'll go on the next slide, I'll explain a little bit about how that works. But a little bit more here is that. Um, to simplify the structure and to take out the arching action and the thrust into the ground, we put this end here on fixed spherical bearings. So these ones here are standard bridge bearings supplied so by um, Maurer in Germany. And on the end here, we have three bearings, uh, which are uh, spherical sliding bearings. The center one slides uh, longitudinally, but it's locked laterally so that the wind load um, can be resisted. And there are two more, one there and one there, which are spherical bearings, but they slide in both directions. So it was to create as simple a scheme in terms of the support as possible. And what that meant was that we didn't end up with a massive thrust at a high level trying to get that back down into the ground and to simplify the substructure. Just a little bit more on how that actually works. In plan, um, if you look, this, the blue shaded zone is if you like, the, the simpler area in terms of how it works. They are simple 2D trusses spanning 120 metres from, meters from the rear wall to the primary truss here between the cores. These are the outer wing areas which, um, which don't have any visible means of support in those areas. So um, what, how we actually got that to work is that those outer areas are actually arches and uh, to, to show how it works, I've got two diagrams here. One where we've only got the centre zone loaded and you can see all the stresses are in the top and bottom cords of these trusses. So they do just span from the rear wall to the primary truss between the cords. In this, this model here, we only loaded the, uh, the wing areas, if you like. And what they do is that they arch. So they arch from this point to this point but because there's no thrusting back into the ground, the, the thrust is actually taken out in in-plane trusses here and here and back into a tie action into the central trusses. So it's, it's quite an elegant closed form to the way that all the forces are contained within the roof. I hope that makes sense. But um, it took us a while to, to create that and, and to, to work it out to make it only work with 2D elements in a very three-dimensional form. And that's actually one of the big stories of, of how this, this, um, this was engineered. All of those elements you saw in that last diagram, each one of them is a straight element, a straight, simple eye section or, um, or fabricated plate um, section. And all of them are around between four and a half and, five and nine metres long. All of the curvature, so when you look at the great sort of seductive curvature of, of the architect's model, all of that is really generated in a detail by curving all the purlin. So all of these elements that on the top surface where we have a cladding of aluminium and the bottom surface where there's a, a cladding of timber, um, the detail of the curvature is created by curving 2D elements which are simple um, universal beam sections. So sort of cheap and cheerful if you like in terms of the elements that we used. And because you only have to curve them in one direction, 
um, it, it creates an economical and a, a, a something that's easily fabricated. One of the key decisions we made very early as well was to separate all of these Perlin structures totally from the primary structure here because we didn't want all of the, the fiddly bits of, of secondary curved elements going in holding up the erection of the roof itself. Um, the Sorry, the concrete structure I'll go on to in just a moment. The steel, there was a very much a collaborative effort between Arup, Balfour Beatty and Rocor, the steel contractor, in terms of, um, of how this was fabricated and erected and all the connection design. Um, it was erected by several trestles along this line here, uh, these three lines, and erected from south to north. Um, one of the things that was, um, was developed early on by Rocor, which we felt was very clever, there was a concern about how do you actually, if you've got so many points of propping, how do you try and drop all of them at the same time when the roof is complete so that you don't overstress one point? How they achieve that is to actually take this southern end, and because these were on spherical bearings, take the southern end, essentially just lift it up and whip out all the, uh, the temporary propping, which is a little bit more complicated than that. But they, um, they actually lifted that around a metre, I think it was, Joe. And, um, which lifted everything clear of the, the propping and it was able to rotate about these, uh, these spherical bearings, spherical bearings on, the, uh, on the cores. Concrete structure, um, there's around 50,000 cubic metres of concrete in the, uh, in the structure. Um, this is the, what we call the plaza structure, it's over the training pool but it's part of the main entry bridge, the F10 bridge, um, into the Olympic site and to the stadium. Uh, all in situ concrete except for precast seating on the, um, on the terraces. And we have 1,800 piles, uh, continuous flight auger piles um, supporting all of the structure. We've, um, we've managed to use, I think as everyone has on the site, is um, a minimum of 25% recycled aggregate, for, which is uh, a, an aggregate which is a byproduct of, of other industries. And we've, um, I think we've, had, we've got 50% cement replacement on the concrete to reduce the, um, the amount of cement that's required in the, uh, in the concrete itself. Uh, this diagram illustrates one of the major issues in terms of the substructure that, uh, that was described earlier on. The plug tunnels, which are the power line underground tunnels, uh, run directly beneath our site. I think from a program point of view, that's one of the issues in terms of doing an Olympics is that the speed of some of the early works that need to be done are done a long time before the buildings over are, are developed. So you, there are constraints that come out of that process that, uh, that you have to deal with. The plug tunnels were one of the major ones that we had to deal with. You can see here where we've got walls supporting the plaza structure uh, land directly over the top of the uh, plug tunnels which are diagonal underneath the site. So we have um, very deep um, transfer slabs that support those walls and the cores over the top of the plug tunnels. And this is a true representative uh, representation of the length of the, uh, the piles as well. They're around 20, I think 21 to 25 metres in depth. Just to, to touch on, uh, on some of the other work that we've been doing, I mean, we did the, um, the structure and the services uh, design uh, as well as lighting for the, uh, the games, oh, sorry, not for the games, for the, the venue. Um, We've, uh, we've had to do a lot of computation of fluid dynamics in terms of the environment inside, both in terms of understanding the temperature with, within the roof space because it gets quite hot and it has an effect on how much the, uh, the roof expands and contracts. But also um, the comfort of the, um, not only the, the uh, athletes inside but also the, uh, and the users, but also, also the spectators. We have to create two quite different environments, one at the pool level and one at the, uh, at the seating area um, to keep both of those users very comfortable. And similarly, we've done a lot of work um, on the uh, facades in terms of the lighting and in, in reducing the glare because glare coming through those windows onto the pools uh, in the legacy mode is, is a key issue in terms of uh, how people are able to, um, to use the pool. Up within the roof void, we have, um, we've got a system where we have speakers, security cameras and lights or within pods within that roof space to, uh, to minimise the effect on the architectural 
um, ceiling that's within that space. It's actually, it's, it's going to be quite a stunning um, space to be inside, this beautiful timber ceiling throughout. And some of the 3D work you can see uh, in our modelling and then the, um, you know, the, the actual constructed condition. We've had to do a lot of, well, all of our documentation was done in 3D, uh, both in terms of the structure and the services. And for a, a, a building of this complexity, there's just no other way of doing it. And I think it's quite interesting to work with Zaha Hadid on this sort of project. They live and breathe in 3D. They don't really do much hand sketching, whereas other architects work very much in 2D. With a Zaha building, you just you, you cannot work in 2D because you, you find everything doesn't work. Nothing fits together. You have to work in 3D. Everything's coordinated, coordinated in 3D. Um, I've just got a short animation of the, the building I wanted to run. Oops. But this, again, comes from our, uh, the documentation tools that we use. I think it's just taking a second to load. You can see the temporary stands here, which will melt away in a second if I'm not quick. They're, um, again, they are all in a very regular grid. We had challenges on either side, although they look fairly simple. There was a river on one side and the loop road on the other and drop-off road. So both had major constraints on either side. Um, this is all the, the substructure you can see here. The pool's deeper than that. I think we modelled the water as well as the, the concrete. Um, Lifting away the, the concrete structure, you can see uh, the services. There's very, a huge amount of ducting within here. We've got plant rooms serving either side of the training pool, competition pool and diving pool within this space. And a lot of um, air movement in and out of the building because of the uh, very tight constraints in terms of the environment. It's always got to be 30, I think it's 20, 28 and 30 degrees in, a, in high humidity in that space. And it's a very large volume of air. And um, sorry, and the other thing I just missed, missed was the, um, the the chillers in the bump on the southern end. We have all the chillers integrated into uh, into the architectural bump in the uh, the southern end of the um, of the building. Just to sort of wrap up, thank, thank Mike. I mean, I think a bit about the the construction, and um, I mean, I think you'd have gathered that there's not much uh, universal section up there. It's mainly plate. Um, and literally from the time that we appointed Rocord in September 2008 and gave them instructions to proceed, you know, the process of converting raw billets on the top left through to what you're seeing now on the bottom right started. Um, we actually were on site in March 2009. Um, the first truss on that southern wall that Mike described was erected on the 24th of March, essentially from a standing start, so quite an achievement. Um, one of the issues that we clearly had to face up to was really removing as much risk as possible in relation to working at height. Um, we, we had grand ideas of, uh, and uh, uh, Mike would have alluded to, you know, but this is before we really concluded with Rocor how we should approach the project. We had ideas of making this on the floor, but of course the roof in itself, in its deepest part, is 11 metres deep. So uh, that notion really, frankly, was unsustainable. So you'll see from the second shot uh, the principle we adopted, which is essentially to make it in a lay down there, make up the steel, deliver the steel piece small. Um, make it up flat, lying on its side, and essentially towing it down to the site and then rearing it up and lifting it onto the pressures that Mike um, described. And, and bear in mind that really until the roof structure is um, completed and, and in its final position, or it's in its intermediate position prior to uh, loading with the roof, we can't start any of the pool tanks at all. So much of the substructure that Mike described earlier couldn't start until that point. So the um, RC Works um, were able to start around about November of last year. You can see the four strand jacking points there that Mike described um, on the southern wall, which and we strand jacked the roof in, in October of 2008, 2009, so literally um, something like eight, eight, nine months ago. So really, I think summing up, you know, we have got to where we got to today. We've got the three pool tanks now cast, um, they're tested. They don't leak, um, which is encouraging. The roof's in its final place, which is really, really important. And I think, as Mike's alluded to, the, the whole process of um, working together with the specialist, gearing the, gearing the expertise of the specialist, using Mike and his colleagues' uh, expertise, working very much with um, 
I suppose in many respects a bit of a dream team really because we have people within the delivery partner, within Valpobiti and within Arup that have got global experience around issues of long span structures and some of the issues that you have to tackle. We were procuring steel at a time when Corbus were closing their steelworks in the UK. So much of the steel that we procured has come from Eastern Europe. That brought with it additional challenges around testing and quality assurance. So the whole collaborative approach, the whole engineering procedure approach, the whole risk reduction approach has been absolutely fundamental in ensuring that we end up with the roofers in the right place and it will perform well over the long period. But I think, um, I think beyond that as well, one has to say that um, you know, we are delivering an iconic venue. Um, this will be a, a truly magnificent venue for 2012, but it's just part of the overall programme um, that's been described earlier. Um, and there aren't many square inches on the Olympic Park where there isn't some activity going on. And I think the collaboration has been described uh, earlier today, this afternoon, um, not only applies in the aquatic venue itself, but across the park worldwide. And I think we'll have um, a venue and a park uh, in 2012 which will be a uh, testament to the contribution of UK construction and engineering. Thank you very much. Engineering taken into account when the 2004 design was put up. Was this uh, an architect's concept that you had to work with? Um, can, you, can you hear me okay? Or do we. I don't know if. Uh, can people at the back, or is it better if the speakers stand up for the people at the back? It's probably. Well, I'll, I'll stand up anyway. Um, the. Uh, well, I think a lot of people are probably familiar with the architecture of Zaha did. And. Um, the Zaha's architectural practice is, is about very unusual forms to us in engineering. So I come from a background where I've done many long span structures where <clears throat> we do start with a blank sheet of paper and, and, and quite often you can drive a form that's long span um, with engineering being the first uh, point, the first criteria. Um, certainly with Zaha's architecture, that's, that's not the case and it is a different sort of architecture to, to deal with. Um, we do work with uh, her team very early on and we, we can move the forms into a, into a way that will work and that is buildable, but um, you are not starting with a pure form and saying, okay, this is, this is a, an engineering exercise to start with and we're going to work in architecture to it. It, it is the other way around. Um, so it's, <clears throat> as I say, for me, it's, this has been one of the most challenging jobs for my career because... I've worked on many long span structures where you do start with a tied arch or you, you do start with something that is was driven very much by the engineering. Um, here we, we start with a form, we can massage it to a degree, um, but because they're very, the form itself and the surfaces are very important to the architect, we are not the ones that actually create the form from scratch. So it's, it's a very different sort of engineering to a different sort of architecture. Next question. Yeah, my name is Chamani. Um, I'm working especially on wireless network and especially sensor networks. And my question is, how do you think uh, wireless technology can be used on this type of buildings? In, in what sense are you using it? In in, in a, not in a structural sense, presumably. Or? For example, you use wireless network sensors for, for some sensing temperature or atmospheric fibers in different parts of uh, building, for example. I'm looking at Bill. Yeah, I think it's probably the wrong group to, uh, to ask the question of, <laughs> to be honest. And what about when you were uh, installing it? I think uh, you need an answer, so I'll, I'll attempt to provide one in relation to the construction. Um, I mean, one thing I've noticed, I mean, I, I'm in my 46th year in this business, and I shall, this will be definitely, I'm definitely at the end of my career. And one of the things I've noticed is the way that technology has contributed to, I guess, not only the way that we survey land and we carry out setting out and we make things in the right place. 
but frankly, without uh, technology uh, in the context certainly of GPS, there's no way that we could have effectively checked and established the fact that, that Mike Troop is in the right place. Um, and the whole concept of, of, of how, uh, so it's wireless technology to a large extent, but certainly the use of GPS is, is being used more widely now within our own businesses is, 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 is remarkable. I don't know if that goes anywhere near answering your question. But in the context of, I think, the, the whole use of wireless technology as it may apply to the, to the venue in use, I don't think this panel is necessarily the right people to ask. Yeah, in terms of the systems. yeah uh, just in terms of the, the building uses as well, um, in the aquatic centre, we, we've not um, installed anything in particular to deal with uh, wireless and, and how people may use them as a, a wireless network as a spectator. Um, it, it hasn't really been seen as, as such a heavy use building. I think if you were looking at something where there are many spectators over a very long period of time, then, then wireless technology could have a very good role to play. But I, unfortunately, there's not somebody from the stadium team to, to answer how that might have been applied in the stadium. And, and I think just from my perspective, from the local perspective, I think it's a huge drive for broadcast and media through wireless technology, which we'll see as probably through 2011, 2012, through some of their partners, the communications providers. So, so you can see broadcast and media going very much wireless, handheld, and for example, you know, um, broadcasting to you your private itinerary, how that fits into building design, I'm not sure. But I can see from the, in the games mode itself, a huge amount of wireless technology will be used. Thank you. Anybody else? Hello, Rob Dixon. Um, Mark mentioned earlier that uh, you learned some lessons from the Millennium Dome. So uh, what lessons have you learned so far from this project that you can use in future projects. Is that, is that to us all? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. <laughs> we could start the top down from John or from the bottom up, yeah. I suppose. I, I think, um, that, yeah, I've, I've been doing this job now, it's not my last job, I've been doing it <laughs> nearly 30 years. Um, and I think the value of the, um, we talked about earlier about the softer skills within uh, the engineering bandwidth of abilities working together, how um, to form collaborative relationships for the good of your own company, for the good of the industry, really being an eye-opener to me. Um, lessons learned, really the value of people working together in co-located teams, irrespective of technology. Um, that's what I've learned more than anything else, really, rather than a technical challenge. It's around how we organize, how we um, manage ourselves for these really complex, ambiguous environments. That's my learning, personally. Yeah, I think there's, uh, there's a huge number of lessons that we'll would, that would take away from this. I would pick, I would pick um, uh, something like the um, engagement, I think, of the supply chain with, um, with, with public sector clients' um, um, requirements for, for governance and for, uh, in this instance, let's say, um, uh, equality and diversity. I think we work together um, we're working together with, uh, with ODA um, very closely on, uh, on diversity issues uh, and um, some of the politi more political drivers like local employment and so on. Uh, and I think that that's a lesson for the future. We're going to be doing that more and more often with other big public sector clients. And I think you know, the sooner the private sector organisations um, get to grips with that when they start a, a major project, I think you know, that's, a, that's a lesson that I'll take away. Yeah, I think I'd echo much of what's been said, really. I think that um, certainly the ODA have, have set very high standards in relation to their expectations, much of which I think has been developed over time. And uh, I think that you know, we're one of a community of um, certainly 16 principal contractors working on the park. Um, the standards that we apply to health and hate, safety and health and environment, I think, are second to none. Uh, we all work together to ensure that we maintain the highest denominator rather than the lowest common denominator. Secondly, around the areas of, of opportunity uh, against uh, apprenticeships, uh, you work with the Princess Trust, uh, local employment, use of local suppliers. Um, we all challenge with that, and we all, we all want to ensure that you know if you if you are living in the region as many people are, you know you have an expectation as to what you want to get out of the games, and therefore we must make sure that we don't have any barriers to local employment or, or local suppliers. And then, then thirdly, the whole area around sustainability, which it, in fact it covers health and safety and covers opportunity is the whole approach to the environment, the whole approach to sustainable design, the whole approach to sustainable construction. 
whether that be waste management, whether that be transport or, or whatever that might be, or the use of materials, or indeed the design of two very ugly, frankly, two very ugly stands that sit either side, but they can go somewhere else in the world after the seven weeks of the Olympic and Paralympic Games. So I think there's a whole piece of work around um, the way that, that, that um, we and the ODA, as, as we as, as contractors and designers have worked with the ODA and the delivery partner in delivering this programme. Uh, and, and the challenge now, I think, is to ensure, and we do a lot of work around this, to what we call the Tier 2 contractors, which are the principal suppliers that actually do the work, you know, that we change them as it, and that they're better for having been working on the park as indeed the principal contractors are better. And we can really have a, a real opportunity of changing the industry. I was involved with T5 in the, in the last 12 months and, you know, that changed the industry. But I think the programme of 2012 has a real uh, opportunity and is definitely changing the way that industry works and the way that public sector procurement will be handled in the future. Thank you. Any more? And I think a lot of people focus on the roof because of its, um, its complexity, but uh, I think when, you've got a, when you look at materials that we've used in the aquatic centre, the roof is 3,000 tonnes of steel, the um, concrete is 50,000 cubic mm. metres, which um, is around 90,000 90, tonnes of, of concrete. Um, so when we were analysing materials, although there's a lot of attention on the roof because of its, um, well, it's, it's such a big visual thing. In terms of overall material uses and impact on the job, it's, it's relatively small. Um, the, so the focus was very much on the concrete, um, reducing the, um, uh, using the secondary aggregates and, and reducing the use of the cement, so having as much cement replacement as possible. They were two of the key elements that we used. Um, we looked at timber for a long time. We tried very hard to, to see whether we could get timber to, to work um, for a roof of that scale. Uh, but at the end, it, it was really pushing the bounds of, of what could be done in that industry. Um, so we went away from it. So in terms of certainty and risk, um, we stuck to steel. Steel is, is still the, the most efficient material for a long span structure and, and to create a long span structure of this complexity in terms of uh, the geometry and with this few number of supports, um, steel is, is still the most sustainable way of doing it. Um, so I think that's the answer for that. I mean, to me, uh, one of the things that I like to think about in terms of sustainability as well, I, I come from a city where um, Sydney Opera House was, was built in 19, or well, in the late 60s, finished in 1973. It's been there for 40 years. It will never be demolished. It's an iconic building that will be there forever. If you were going to be building a building that was not the sort of building that we have out on the aquatic centre, and it was a building that's only meant to have a 25, 30 year design life, then in terms of sustainability, to go and replace that after a shorter design life, I think is, is a much greater impact on sustainability. You said earlier on that you had three principal objectives. One was time and cost, and the third one was fitness for purpose. I just wonder whether you could say as the design, as the development, as the whole construction process developed, you could tell us a little bit how you, how you felt you converged on the fitness for purpose. I mean, I can imagine the time of a cost bit, but it's the trying to figure out how you actually converge it on fitness for purpose. And if you could comment on that. <coughs> um, I think fitness for purpose, this is directed at uh, the aquatic centre design. Or, the whole thing. Well, yeah. the aquatic centre design, I think fitness for purpose was very much focusing on the, on the legacy. And, and I think that was actually one of the key things that, that developed through our design. Um, looking at the fitness for purpose in the Olympics and not trying to over provide something in the Olympics that you then have to live with as a, a white elephant for, for the rest of the building life. 
Um, so there's very much been a focus on, on legacy and creating a, a fantastic legacy building and then having it, it fit for purpose for the Olympics. I don't know if others want to copy on the discuss. Yeah, I think from, from, from the park's point of view, I think fitness for purpose has, uh, has been challenged and, uh, and, and met with all of the stakeholder engagement that has gone on um, consistently throughout the whole of the design piece. So there's been a huge number of um, uh, third parties and stakeholders that have um, that have been involved uh, as the design has developed um, and so that's not only I mean that ranges from from utility providers through to um, sports groups LOCOG um, uh, sorry yeah absolutely disability groups and 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 and, and, and local residents and so on so so the, as the design has been developed that fitness of purpose has been tested and, and you know one has to compromise um, if there are conflicting points of view but 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 it's been tested throughout by um, uh, and contributed to throughout by all of the various stakeholders i think i just had a fundamental yeah. question always has been um do you do you go temporary or do you go permanent I mean, almost every time it's can you do this in a temporary facility? Have you got well? Firstly, have you got an existing facility? If you haven't got an existing facility that works, you're going to have to build new for the games. And if you're building new for the games, then is it temporary or permanent? And the biggest temporary one we've got is the basketball arena, which is a 12,000 seat uh, building, uh, which is just as simply a very simple series of space frames with a uh, an architecturally designed PVC um, cladding to it, but really a very simple uh, structure. Uh, on, other, on some occasions we found that building temporary was two-thirds of the cost of building permanent, and so it became a well, you know, in terms of legacy, at least we've got more for it if we go for a permanent structure, because the temporary structures, as you get big, do become very, very expensive. Um, I think in something like the aquatic, um, it is a pure case of iconic architecture. You know, what, is, what, is, what are we leaving? We're leaving something which is very iconic. I don't think you would defend the aquatic centre as being you know, a beautiful sort of piece of neat engineering fit for purpose. You are driven by the architecture. Um, the building where it's been a far more complex approach um, is the uh, velodrome. Uh, the velodrome has been, I would argue, probably a far more integrated design process um, with architects and engineers sort of leading one another to a, to a solution and probably one would argue a more sustainable solution in pure sustainability terms uh, at the end of the day on the, on the velodrome. So each one has, has, has been different, um, trying to get that, that balance between all these competing um, um, expectations and requirements. Or I think I'd just put in another word of defence for, uh, uh, for the aquatic centre. Uh, if you look at Sydney, the number of um, Olympic-sized pools in Sydney is 50. If you look at London, the number of Olympic-sized pools in London is not, and there will be one uh, when this is finished. So, so this is going to be, or two, you know, there's going to be, I mean, this is going to be uh, you know, a long-lasting, and, and is designed and intended to be a long-lasting uh, structure. So it isn't, it isn't, sustainability is not just measured in terms of the uh, material consumption. It's also going to be measured in terms of how long it's used and how many people use it. Okay, it's uh, five, past, five past four. Um, have we got one more before we break for tea? Yes, one down on the right there. I've seen the criticisms about the inadequacy of clearing nuclear waste from the site. <laughs> yes, um, I, with some irritation I might add, uh, I, the nuclear waste on the site uh, were essentially some, uh, were essentially some uh, luminous dials which were found um, in one corner of the site. Um, prior to that people had speculated that there might be um, uh, sort of various um, uh, waste on the site, particularly waste of, so not nuclear, but um, radiated waste. And uh, none, none, was, none was found in all the uh, site inspections. And then finally, when we were working in the north, co uh, north corner of the site, um, where there was a lot of uh, material which had been dumped uh, from demolition activity from the uh, Second World War, we came across these um, irradiated uh, uh, 
uh, dials, and uh, those were dealt with um, with um, all the various um, authorities um, who would be interested from HSE and, and others. And at the end of the day, the conclusion was that the simplest way to deal with them was simply to um, um, bury them uh, on the site, um, which we've done uh, primarily under a big land bridge where, uh, which we've built. And that was something which was developed and agreed. And to a large extent, you know, what did the various authorities concerned about this um, want to, to see? Because frankly, it was not an enormous, uh, enormous issue. Um, but um, you know, it's a story which, given the nature of it, runs, um, uh, causes me some uh, irritation each time it runs, uh, because it is just a, a minor story. But I suppose, in a way, it points to the fact that, by and large, there is not a lot else negative to write about at the moment, on the, uh, as far as the Olympic development is concerned. And so, stories like that will always get uh, will always get a little bit of space. But it's the same story, which has now been run about uh, three times over the last six months. Right. Um, we'll move on for a cup of tea. And uh, thank you to our speakers for this first half of the session. Thank you. What I thought would be useful for you this afternoon is, is trying to share with you a sense of the scale of form and nature of the Games and how that relates to transportation. And in particular, the challenges it poses to the nation, how we're meeting those challenges and the strategies we're adopting. Then we really split the next bit down into two sections. What we'll about transport for the Games families, the athletes, the media, the technical officials, and such like. Then focus on the spectators and wrap up with a bit about progress in transport and the venues themselves. I guess the first point from a transportation perspective is we have to recognise there is nothing bigger than this. It is enormous, it is off-scale, it is roughly 20 times bigger than a World Cup. And John's giving you the superlatives, there are some of the numbers. But coming wrapped with the Olympic Games comes wrapped with the Paralympic Games. The world's second biggest multi-sport event in its own right. And you have a huge workforce, so it's very, very big. Second thing from a transport perspective is, yes, we have the main Olympic Park, yes, it contains many of the iconic venues, but the Games are spread much wider across London and the UK. So we have the venues in the river zone, we term it. Five temporary arenas in Excel, seven sports operating down there. Greenwich Park, equestrian modern pentathlon. A bit further afield in the centre of town, just around the corner here, beach volleyball. Uh, uh, Earl's Court for the volleyball itself. Hyde Park, triathlon, Lords for the archery. Some of the venues that we use today. So football semis in the finals up at Wembley. Wimbledon for the lawn tennis. Paralympic tennis coming in, board to Eaton Manor. And then just around the periphery of London, to the west, we've got the rowing and flat water canoeing. To the north, the new whitewater canoeing centre, which we're constructing in the minute. And out to the east, at Hadley Farm, mountain biking. But it's not just the park, it's not just London. It extends further afield still. So Weymouth and Portland will host the sailing for the Olympic and Paralympic Games. And then many of the classical football venues across the UK will then pick up the football competition leading up to those finals and the semis of the men's and women's competition. So it's big and it's dispersed. Second thing is, it's not just a Saturday afternoon of sport. It's not a weekend of sport. It's an entire summer of sporting and cultural events that will kick off from the beginning of June with uh, Her Majesty's Diamond Jubilee. By the end of June, the media started to ship into the broadcast centre. Middle of July, the village opens. 16 days then of competition for the Olympic Games, come off the back of that, two weeks of transition, and you're off and running again for another 12 days of competition for that at the Paralympics. What that means is that there are four key challenges we face as a nation. One, get everyone where they need to be on time. Two, we've got to keep London and the rest of the UK moving. Much as I'd like to have a blank canvas, nobody's going to give it to us. So we've got to keep the UK sustained. Thirdly, leave behind us a legacy. For us in the transportation field, it's not just a hard legacy of the transport infrastructure we're putting in, but a softer legacy about the way people think about using public transport to sporting and cultural events. And lastly, we've got to be mindful around the issues of value for money. Now, the transport strategies we've adopted have four elements. One, and I make no bones about it, we will prioritise like maniacs on the needs of the athletes. Two reasons for that. 
Firstly, there's a moral imperative. These are people who've spent 15 years of their life trained for this one particular day, and if we let them down, I will be ashamed. Secondly, if you make a mistake, like other cities have done, and they don't turn up on time at the event, you can absolute burp to 4 billion people across the globe. And it has happened before, and we're not going to have the same in London. Secondly, the sheer numbers of people involved in terms of spectators for the sports and cultural events mean that we have to make these games based around public transport. And our objective is that 100% of spectators will use public transport, walk or cycle to get to the games. Thirdly, we want to make these an accessible and a truly inclusive games. And for us, that means we want to put in transport systems that support the needs of anyone, whether an athlete, a, a member of the workforce, a spectator, that meets your mobility or sensory needs. And whilst we can't do up every single underground station, for example, prior to the games, we can use those that are available, plus tr road transport, to make a games network for accessible transport. And lastly, we touched on this earlier, this issue of sustainability. For us in the transportation field, what this means is getting the best off the existing transport systems wherever you possibly can. Where there's a long-term legacy need to upgrade that transport, you upgrade it. And where there isn't a long-term legacy need, put in a temporary transport system for that peak of the peak. For the Games family themselves, a very large number of them, they'll need to be moved in effect in a pri private public transport system using a fleet of something like 1,500 coaches and buses from their accommodation to their place of competition or work as it were. Wherever possible we are attempting to try get their journey time sub 30 minutes so they don't get <coughs> to the venue stressed out. And each of those systems serving the athletes, the media, technical officials and such like will have separate fleets of vehicles operating out of individual depots. Now to do that we will create a swift corridor, an Olympic route network which connects, has a system of roads that connects all the accommodation with the place of competition. And on that road net we'll put in a network, we'll put in a series of interventions, both physical, by way of left turns and right turns, few lanes, and then some adjustments in terms of intelligent transport systems by way of adjusting the way the traffic control systems work during games time. And there'll be a similar version to that for the Paralympic Games. Within the context of London, the main route will obviously connect the village here which houses the athletes to the competition venue south and then the central town. And off that core network, we then spool off to the individual smaller competition venues such as Wimbledon. In case bad things happen on the main road network, we then have an alternative network designated in the grey here, and then we have the training venues shown in yellow. That whole process will move forward over the next two years as we start to get the traffic regulation orders through later this year. For spectators, the number varies considerably day to day, driven by the sports schedule itself. Day zero is the opening ceremony, 80,000. From then on, you're rapidly peaking up to around 950,000 people on day two across the UK as a totality. From a, tr from a technical perspective, the most interesting day is day seven here, which is the first day the main stadium comes into operation for the first time. We will operate two 80,000 seat sessions from there on through. A lot of the demand up the top here being the regional football stadium. So the second week onwards is very, very busy. The key destination for most people, obviously, within the context of London, will be the Olympic Park, roughly a third of them. But many of the other venues will also provide a big demand, whether that be Excel, Horse Guards Parade, or Royals Court. And in the UK context, actually, some 30% of the tickets will be for events outside London itself. So very considerable cross-movements, not just towards London, which need to be provided for. Where they travel from is very much driven by where the closest to the venues. And what this means is that on travel on the day of the event is very much in the context of London, in the area of east of England and south east here, with London accounting for some 40% of travel. The key destination obviously will be the Olympic Park itself. It's the best connected in Olympic history and will be feeding 80% of spectators through rail hubs. West Ham for South here, Stratford Regional here and Stratford International North. And by the time we've boosted train service on the 10 lines feeding the, the park, we'll have a total gross capacity of some 240,000 people per hour, a net capacity of some 120,000. The remaining 20% of spectators will come through two transport miles, 
one to the south and one to the north here, which carry facilities for walking, cycling, direct coach and park and ride systems which we're putting in for games operation. One of the cunning tricks we're playing to get extra transport capacity for the games is we're borrowing the new high-speed trains that are being delivered as part of the South Eastern Trains franchise. We'll bolt them together to make big 12-car consists and every six minutes we'll fire them from St Pancras eastbound towards the park itself. Those trains will then go down into Kent, many of them reversing the Ebbs Fleet for a 10-minute journey back into the park. For spectators from mainland Europe, Brussels and Paris, Brussels is one hour 40 away, they will take the Eurostars and then cross-platform interchange at Ebbs Fleet and then shuttle into the park here. The reason for that is we need all four platform faces at, at uh, Stratford International for the domestic shuttles. Conventional business people sit on the Eurostar to King's Cross. South of the river, the venues there at Royal Artillery Barracks and Greenwich, well served by mainline rail. Docklands Light Railway will serve the ones to the north of the river, along with the upgraded Jubilee Line, uh, which has a new signalling system going in by Christmas this year. It's also an area of opportunity in terms of using the river. 5% mode share at Greenwich uh, to around 7% serving Maritime Greenwich itself and the equestrian events there. In the centre of town, easily served by public transport, using the mainline rail terminal, the underground stations, and also the significant bus routes in the centre of town, so it doesn't so it pose a particular challenge. In terms of progress and where we are today, I think we're making reasonable headway. Having said that, we'll probably still be tears before bedtime. Uh, for the heavy and the rail and the major projects that are associated with that, there's good progress being made. Uh, the service delivery plans and the timetables have already been drawn up now, ready for expediting, so we know what time the last trains will leave London uh, out to communities such as Cardiff, Portsmouth and such like. And in general, we'll be taking them out about an hour and a half later than normal so that we can get people home again at night. We've got the commercial heads of terms agreed with the train operating companies. And for us now, it's all a case of working with the other major projects in London, whether that be Thames Water and the utility projects, but also Crossley and Thameslink, because we need to keep them operating during games time as well. Walking and cycling is important to us. Not only is it healthy and sustainable, but it also alleviates public uh, transport uh, crowding. We've therefore put significant sums of money in total in the ODA, some £25 million into it, to try and persuade as many people as we possibly can to use this as a mode of access to the games. Some 4 million people live within 40 minutes push bike distance of the games venue. River services will never compete with the Jubilee Line, but will provide an added advantage for us and extra overcapacity, and provide more of a day out to many of our spectators. <coughs> there are bits of the country, however, despite the best will in the world, we cannot do anything about upgrading the rail services to. There are no railway lines there, or they're overcrowded. Therefore, we have created a strategic coach network across the UK, which we'll use during games time drive spectators direct to the competition venue, in particular the Olympic Park. Some thousand vehicles are now under contract to us for that summer of 2012 to provide the park and ride systems as well as that coach network. The park and ride comes in two flavours. Some big park and rides around the periphery of London where we take people out of their cars and then shuttle them in, and then some smaller park and rides at some of the venues outside London. So for example, serving Eton Dorney, which is not that well served by public transport directly. Obviously within the context of London and some of the other regional centres we'll be boosting existing bus services, getting the best off them, but also laying in dedicated shuttles for that last mile up, for example, Southfields to the, shoot, to the tennis or from Woolwich Arsenal up onto the top for the shooting. There are various groups we're mobilising behind the games. Road freight is important to us in the, because we need to sustain catering, hotels and other commerce. So we're working with them around recasting their logistics diagrams for 2012. Similarly, temporarily at least, pieces broken out between the taxi and private hire society who are working together to serve the games. Important to us because London's 22,000 black cabs are highly accessible and will be used for us. I touched earlier on this issue of accessible transport. We can't, as I said, do up all of the mainline rail system or the underground system prior to games time. But using that combination of road, rail, community transport association vehicles and such like, plus blue badge parking, we can make a material difference to the way spectators get to the games. 
to persuade people to use public transport who classically may not have used it in the past, and that's our objective. Something like six and a half billion pounds worth of transport infrastructure upgrade has now been completed. The final remaining individual bits and pieces, such as the Docklands Light Railway extension up here, through to Stratford International Commission by the turn of the year, along with the Jubilee Line upgrade here. The rest of this rail infrastructure has all been upgraded or nearing completion now. With the venues themselves, progress is good. The main stadium, built at 80,000, dropping back to 25,000 seats, potentially in legacy. The roof covering is now on place. And we started gardening works in the middle on the track and field section there, with fit out well away. This will be well served by the Docklands Light Railway, uh, post games, along with Stratford Regional Station to the east of the structure itself. Aquatics, the main flow of people will be from the main station here, through Stratford, onto this main bridge here, and then flowing back into the aquatic centre there. Uh, we intend to complete that venue uh, middle of next year. Velodrome, progress <coughs> stunningly well at the minute. Um, we hope to complete that venue roughly around the turn of the year, and that will be, then be used in legacy, and we'll use the high-speed trains coming off St Pancras to sort of Stratford International, so people who want to use this national training centre, uh, either for competition or for visiting, will be able to use that. The basketball structure, uh, the final bit of cladding on that went up this morning, uh, looking good, and then that'll be reused post-games elsewhere. Handball, a 6,000 seat venue to the west, uh, will be served as a, used as a multi-sport venue post-games, um, about 7,000 games time, again being served by Hackney Wick and the new upgraded North London line there. The broadcast centre and media centre to the northwest of the park that's taking shape now. The main structure itself for the broadcast centre is complete as the, and we're now heavily into the fit out of the media centre. These were left behind in legacy for reuse by our successors. The village itself is incredibly well connected to public transport. In fact, the Docklands Light Railway extension is just right outside the front of the venue itself. Um, and then you have the high speed rail lines to Europe and the South East. So looking good there. Uh, progress very good. What are the headlines I'd like to leave with you? This is stupendously big, what we've embarked upon. Um, having said that, it provides huge opportunities as a consequence of its size. Those opportunities do have a come with challenges, and to date we've met those, but over the remaining 110 weeks, the real issue for us is moving this thing from dry construction project and infrastructure project into a raw operation that is seamless and faultless as far as the spectator, competitor and the rest of the world is concerned. Thank you for your attention. A few words perhaps about the old testing of this lot. I mean, so often we just see these wonderful projects and at the end of the day, it's when we get them into reality. Uh, this take new term of five, and what a tragedy, a wonderful project, and then finally, we get all the publicity, which is very negative even today when you go overseas. We must avoid that. How do we do it? I agree with you entirely. Um, if I talk in the generality and then in the transportation context, the real issue for us is we have to get to games readiness prior to that opening ceremony on July the 27th. And therefore, we have to work back from that in terms of the various levels of testing and games readiness. In a transport context, we have four, four levels of systems testing we will be doing ranging from the micro-testing and simulation and the desktoping and the rest of the individual elements up through to the major uh, integrated volume testing where we will look to pressure test the systems with very large numbers of people. The park itself will need uh, licensing and that will require ramp-up events as well as sports test events. The opening, for example, of the retail centre at Stratford there, again, will generate huge demand. So we will use those volume events plus a lot of other individual testing of elements to try and prove out the system itself. The one thing that we are clear on, though, is that despite our best efforts at predicting the future and what might go wrong, we won't be able to predict everything. And therefore, one of the big lessons we've learned over the last seven years of being involved in this thing is we need to build in a large degree of resilience in terms of an ability to, to roll with the punch, to understand what the problem is, invent solutions rapidly, 
deploy resources to fix those problems and then move on. I say that because when I've ever spoken to colleagues who've done this thing in the past, they say that roughly once a day something big will happen and you need an ability to recover. An ability to rustle up 300 buses at short notice, fire up extra drivers, fire up extra navigators, put the plug back in the aquatic centre, whatever it may be. Um, we just know that will happen. If I may have a, a, a supplementary, please. Uh, I mean, one of the key points that you've made is that London's got to continue to work as normal. If you take so many of the businesses, there's just no way they're all going to close down. I mean, lots of people will go into the games, but still businesses as usual. My experience is that if you can actually try to get the normal traveling public into a frame of mind where some of these diversions and different ways of doing things are actually in operation perhaps even a couple of weeks before the games really takes, takes off. Although it's going to be an inconvenience to people, nevertheless, the value of that, you know, knowing that you've got to turn left rather than right, you've got to be in the third lane and not the fifth lane, all of that kind of issue would be so much more help. Is that a possibility? Is that something you're considering? Yeah, I agree with you entirely. Um, we have a phrase known as business as unusual. I mean, we're hosting 26 world championships all at the same time, all at the same place. On a good day in London, we are looking at probably 750,000 spectators and probably the same again to, to the cultural events that go with the Games itself, the live sites and all the rest of it that goes with it. Um, something like 30 or 40 percent of existing employees will be on leave. I mean, 30 percent are on leave anyway in the summer period in this particular time of year. And even more will go on leave during 2012. And the real issue for us is working through that pattern providing people with the information that allows them to revise their time of travel, revise their route, to work from home, to do all those things differently, such that they can celebrate the games and welcome the world to London. And that's the real trick for us. We've got a major program therefore in place over the next 18 months to two years that will work with both businesses, existing background users, but also in particular around spectators about how they route, when they route, and they're giving themselves enough time on the public transport systems. Gentlemen at the back there. Thank you. Uh, David Anderson, Warwick University. Uh, just thinking about the access to the Javelin services at St Pancras, um, it seems to me that the numbers of people that are going to be passing through St Pancras is going to be vastly greater than we have at the moment with the access to the Eurostar and the Javelin services to Kent. You're going to have hordes of people going through St Pancras and then people have actually got to get from the underground lines probably or the buses into St Pancras and then onto the Javelins to Stratford International. And I just wonder if you could share uh, your thoughts on the, uh, the, the passenger flow and the passenger problems at St Pancras during the Olympic period. Okay. Um, we modelled passenger flows on the public transport networks by 15 minute increments by day of games. So we know where people would wish to travel and then how we would like them to travel. You're quite right in pointing out that the javelin shuttles from St Pancras to the park are very alluring in the sense that they have a very short generalised cost associated with them with a 6 minute 45 hour runtime. The trick we have to pull off is to persuade people to use those other routes that are just as time effective. So for example uh, Liverpool Street to Stratford is 7 minutes. A lot of capacity there, we want to move people onto that system. Similarly, from Fenchurch Street out east to West Ham, using the C2C capacity there. And then the North London line swinging around. Therefore, in the vernacular, we use the phrases, just as we will have javelin when may have discus, I don't know, shot put and anything, any other ironmonger you hurl through the air. So discus, hammer, shot put and javelin probably will be co-prime in terms of branding. But you're quite right. And ultimately, however, it will be a bit like Disney, where we will probably have a sign up in front of St Pancras station that says if you're waiting here you'd actually be faster getting on, back on the tube and going to Liverpool Street. Um. You, um, there's going to be vast numbers of people obviously coming to this thing, many from overseas, also from around the country that don't know London particularly well. You've talked about the sort of what I call the hardware of the services. What about the people side? Is somebody going to provide stewards and guides at the key places? And who's responsible for that? There will be a lot of volunteers. Uh, there'll be two sorts of volunteers. There'll be city operations volunteers to guide people through the city, but also there'll be games volunteers provided by the organising committee to help steward and provide information and help 
to spectators on the final mile to games and inside the venues themselves. Over and above that, we want to develop a transport relationship with the spectators from the moment they buy their sports ticket. And therefore, we're looking to provide personalised journey planning capability to spectators and then maintain a dialogue with them through that 18 months, including real-time information during games time. So that if there are problems on the day, we can reroute you by your mobile, your PDA, or whatever it may be, to a much more sophisticated form of transportation relationship that has been applied in the past to major sports events. The different here, difference here is with 10 million spectators, it's worthwhile putting in the effort to try and get that relationship going. Sorry? We are heavily involved. Uh, there's a whole security strand and a public safety strand that's working with us and city operations to try and make the city itself perform effectively. Uh, not just in terms of the competition venues, but the non-competition venues, the sports houses that we set up by the individual sponsors, you know, the Holland House, the Jamaica House, all those things will create uh, attractions to Londoners and people from outside London. So we're having to work with many, many people to make the whole thing flex and work effectively throughout the whole game cycle. Uh, Ryan Thomas, DSDL. Uh, to what extent have security considerations played into your transportation plannings and what contingencies do you have in place should the worst happen during the Olympics? Right. Uh, there is a whole security stream uh, that takes out the whole of the Games itself, and that's about an Olympic and a Paralympic strand. Within that overall security stream, there are then four work streams that deal with aviation, maritime, road and rail transport security. Uh, one of the issues for us, obviously, is working out what is different in terms of business as usual, what are the consequences of creating new attractions in different places where normally you don't get very large numbers of people coming. And therefore, for us, the real issue is working with the various forms of security to adjust the pattern of security to accept where we are today because on the transport system it's always severe anyway in, this, in the UK and then accept the fact that you will then need to have a scalable solution if the risk profile changes and that's where we are. Yes, yeah, so it's going to be on to something slightly different, sort of slightly away from civil engineering into really probably the world of really mechanical engineering. Um, I trained as a mechanical engineer and I feel very lucky to combine the huge passion for innovation and, and engineering and science with uh, my other deep passion in life which is sport. Um, I think it's a, it's a very lucky place to be. And um, I'm here today to really talk about the, the role that engineering has in, in the Paralympics but I'll also touch on how it, um, it, how it has influenced and shaped um, the world of sport in general. So, just quickly a bit about what we do, um, so I'm, I'm based in Sheffield Ham University, we've got a research centre and we essentially we try to uh, unpick some of the fundamental physics and the fundamental um, laws that govern sports, so we, we might be in, involved in um, you know, looking at tennis racket design, the effect that the, the string bed has and how much spin you can generate when you're on your forehand shot. Uh, we will do that for people like the International Tennis Federation who are actually interested in maybe regulating um, the sport and making sure that us engineers don't get too much of an advantage or, or change the sport too much. Um, uh, we, so, uh, yeah, so all sorts of things to do, the classic sort of engineering studies looking at things like impact and um, the effect that we, the way we can use new materials um, to just to change things in sport, how we can push things forward. Um, we're also involved in, um, I thought I'd show a few topical things with, with Wimbledon and the World Cup happening. Um, so th things like measurement are very important to us. Um, in sports, people always want to know where things are and how things are moving, how fast they're going, um, whether they've crossed the goal line or not, um, something we're, we're very interested in as well. Uh, and, and not just about measuring where they are, um, but also trying to predict what might happen if you change something. So if you change the design of a football, for instance, how might it fly through the air? And of course, you know, in engineering, we can predict these things, we can understand them and foresee what might happen. Um, so we get involved in doing that sort of thing as well. Um, and I guess we, I'll, just, just, I'll, I'll, I'll dip into this a bit later because we, we use uh, sort of the plethora of, of sort of engineering teeth that I'm sure a lot of us uh, are aware of here. Things like three-dimensional laser scanning, simulation, computational fluid dynamics, all these things come together to help us to understand the world of sport better. 
And um, we do it for lots of different people, whether they be sort of companies um, who want to make better products, or perhaps um, UK Sport, who want to have the best athletes for the games. So we're very involved in developing um, elements of the bike that the British team <coughs> rode to great success um, in Beijing. Elements like the wheels, the handlebars, the helmets, um, different features on the bike. And it's all about optimising the engineering design. It's about shaving off those hundredths of seconds through choice of materials, choice of shape, choice of design, proving it in simulation or in, indeed in wind tunnels, um, all the classic sort of engineering tools, and then hopefully, at the end of the day, seeing, seeing the results, uh, which um, we've been very lucky to do. And a few things, another example, of course, um, the thing we were very involved in was the um, very successful Skeleton Bob, um, which we had with uh, Amy Williams um, just this year in Vancouver. Again, similar sort of problem to the cyclists. You've got this very high speed sport, very sh small winning margins. If you can shave off, well, if you make a few, a few alterations to the design of maybe a helmet or a bodysuit, you can start shaving off thousands of seconds. If you do enough of them, you start getting hundredths of seconds. And that's when you get into the, into the realm of maybe being able to move someone up from a silver into a gold. Uh, I'm not saying that we did that because uh, you know, the athletes ultimately are responsible for their performance. And indeed, if you actually look at those two cases of, say, bobsleigh and cycling, even though we know that they had the best equipment, um, the advantage from the equipment was actually very small compared to their winning margins. In um, the case of, say, British cycling, the bike was at best a couple of hundredths of seconds faster than the best, the next best bike, but the cyclist, you know, Bradley Wiggins was winning by seconds. Um, so it actually was the athlete's performance. They were responsible for actually winning those gold medals, as much as we'd like to claim we were. Um, but anyway, I'm here to talk about, really, about um, sort of engineering Paralympic sport. Um, and um, just to say, really, you know, science and engineering have been at the heart of sort of the Paralympic movement. Paralympic movement really from when it was um, conceived and at State Mandeville Hospital because it was, you know, initially it was, it was a medical rehabilitation kind of, um, well that's where the idea for it came, came from, it was about rehabilitating injured pers uh, service personnel. And so the whole sort of notion of science um, was sort of embodied right, right from the very start and, and it still is today, it's a, it's a major strand in the Paralympic movement how, how, we can, how, how science can be used in the Paralympic movement. Um, we've got involved um, in, in a number of different guises, um, doing sort of similar sorts of things for Paralympic athletes as we do for um, non-disabled athletes. So, for example, um, some, some simple things. Um, this is actually on, on a racing wheelchair, testing the, um, effectively the camber on the wheels. The more camber you have, the more rolling resistance you have. Uh, but it actually um, improves your ability to move the wheelchair around the track and your stability. You also have to be able to get your arms over the side of the wheels to be able to push. Um, so we're doing their experiments, actually changing the camber, seeing how we can optimise this rolling resistance, and then actually testing athletes on it, seeing how if they use more or less energy with different cambers. It's trying to optimise the system. And for, for something like wheelchair racing, it's really some of, some of the systems are pretty crude. Even the, the very best elite athletes, athletes like, say, Dave Weir and, and Dave Holding, the equipment they were using was really quite, quite poor, even just poorly maintained actually, let alone sort of optimised for elite performance. Um, but of course then it goes on and um, we start looking at doing things like, uh, say we do for the British cyclists, so let's have a look at the aerodynamics. Certainly in, um, in the case of wheelchair racing, the athletes are going fast enough for aerodynamic forces to have quite a considerable impact on, on the athlete's performance. And so, um, you know, we do it through... Um, I guess your classic tools of computation. Uh, this is just making a few sort of design changes. You know, what if we put sort of a, um, basically a mesh on the athlete's trunk to stop this block, this sort of bluff body that stops this airflow and creates this sort of this big pressure difference between the front and the back of the, the chest. You know, I don't know if you ever noticed, you've ever seen um, in, in the wooden marathon perhaps, you see wheelchair athletes pulling their t-shirt down over their knees. Uh, effectively, that's what they're doing. They're trying to reduce this bluff body effect. And, um, and, and a few other alterations as well, looking at the airflow underneath the bottom of the wheels and, and, and the front there as well. And of course, we can simulate it, see what we think might happen, obviously validate this sort of things in wind tunnels as well, and, um, and see, see, what, see what difference it can really make. Um, 
we did this for um, an athlete, um, Dave Holding, who is the current um, T. He, he races in T45, which is the sorry T54, sorry, which is the um, sort of very high mobility um, sort of wheelchair racer, and, and he was a um, European champion, world record holder, gold medalist. Um, this was built in the build-up to the Sydney Games, and um, we could validate really that, he, that if he had made these changes, um, he would have shaved off about. Um, 0.2 seconds over the 100 meters. Uh, 0.2 seconds over 100 meters is a lifetime. That's like the you know it separates the top five. Um, for some reason, um, British Wheelchair Racing Association weren't very happy, weren't very keen. Um, maybe they thought it was going to move the sport too radically forward. Um, but then you know, um, sorry, let me just, let's move on. Um, yes, yeah, so, so, sorry, similar similar idea there. Just uh, I've gone. If you're not doing it, someone else is. Um, unfortunately, Dave Holding didn't win because other people were using aerodynamic features, had really thought about their equipment very carefully. And if you're not, and this is the point, if, if you're not optimising your equipment in elite sport, someone else will. Uh, there's all sorts of issues to do this because at, at, at the end of the day, we're, we're in the business of creating an advantage by using engineering. Now, um, this is a, a, a debate which um, you know, lots of people have quite strong views on, really, and um, I guess it comes down to a question of, you know, is it your moral obligation to make a level playing field where everyone can have a fair chance, or is it your moral obligation to be the best you possibly can be? Um, and uh, you know, people like UK Sport, for instance, they want to win gold medals, um, and you know, uh, to a large extent, I think the success of the games will be judged on how many gold medals we win. That's, that's, that's what, you know, it is about sport at the end of the day, and, and winning is what counts, really. Um, certainly in elite sport, and matter what you like, like to think about the Olympic ethos of kind of being this all-encompassing, wonderful, kind of friendly event, it's about winning, it really is about winning. Um, anyway, um, I'm going to move on to another um, area where engineering has made huge advances um, in disability sport, and that's in the case of um, disabled runners, amputees who run with Prosthetics. So this is um, some footage that I just took the other day at the, um, the BT Paralympics World Cup event in, um, in Manchester, which is a fantastic, fantastic day. And um, you can see here the, the um, single below the knee amputees running in the 100, 100 metres, yeah, just, just finishing coming across the line. Now, I guess the name of the game here is, the, um, is trying to actually create a prosthesis or a prosthetic that mimics the action of uh, the remaining leg. Um, you can't really have a go faster leg on one side if the other leg can't keep up. It become, you become very unbalanced and you waste then all your energy trying to control this thing. So for, for single leg amputees, really it's about creating a sort of symmetry in the body. Um, and uh, if you don't do that, you actually start losing performance if you, if you try and create um, one prosthetic with a larger gait or, or better energy return on one side than the other. It creates an awful lot of imbalance. Um, however, there are a, a, a relatively small club of athletes who um, are bilateral amputees. And so they run with two prosthetic legs. And so you don't have this problem of trying to mimic the, the remaining leg. Uh, and indeed, you can supersede the abilities of muscle and bone uh, by, by using prostheses. Now this is uh, the really sort of the, the pin-up boy of, of the Paralympics, Oscar Pistorius, and he, um, for those of you who haven't heard of him, he's, he's become quite an icon really. Um, 100 metre world record holder, gold medalist, 200 metre, 400 metre, he really has done them all, and by quite large margins. Um, there aren't many runners who run with two prosthetic legs, and there's a number of reasons for that. Um, it's, a fairly, it's fairly rare to lose both legs, um, although, and, well, unfortunately, not, not so much now with um, recent sort of wars and so forth, but um, the, it's actually quite hard if, you're, if you had legs to learn to run. You can learn to walk with prostheses um, if you lose your legs, but to learn to run at high speed doing 400 metres, 
you know, 400 metre sprint in 45 seconds. To be able to learn to run like that um, when, when you've had a sudden trauma late in life, it's very hard. So Oscar Pistorius was actually born with a congenital deformity. He, he was born without his um, tibia bone, which means that he was actually amputated, um, kind of effectively at birth, or I think when he was two or three. So he's learned, really learned to walk on prosthetics. And people would argue that gives him a, a big advantage. Well, he's a fairly unique, in a fairly unique club of people who, who, who have this. Now, um, the, the story really, oh, sorry, I'll just go back, with Oscar is that um, he wants to run in the Olympics. Um, he doesn't really, I think he probably still wants to run the Paralympics. I mean, he said he, he, he doesn't, but I think he probably will. Um, but he, he, um, he, he wants to run in, in the Olympics against other non-disabled 400 meter runners. Now the debate is, should he, should he be allowed to run? And I think it comes down to a question of science about the level of performance enhancement that perhaps prostheses give you. So I'm just going to delve into just a little bit of the, the underlying science as to what's going on here. Um, and the first thing is to, to look at what happens when someone runs. And um, effectively, this, this is a graph of, 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 of um, this is about 20 elite runners and how they perform when they run out of the blocks. So these are their times for the first 100 metres. Your first 100 metres is about 11, 11 seconds. It's quite slow because you're starting, you're accelerating from a, from a, from a standing start. You're faster in the second 200 metres. Uh, then you start to slow, and then the final 100 metres is always the slowest. Um, in fact, there's um, no real runners in history that have ever run a faster second half of 400 metres to a first half, um, apart from Oscar Pistorius. Um, so this is, um, again, just the data. So it's in virtually every athlete, and these are elite athletes, their second 200 metres is always a couple of seconds down on their first 200 metres. Apart from Oscar Pistorius, whose second 200 metres is about two seconds faster than his first 200. Now, this raised the alarm bells with um, the IAAF, the International Amateur Athletics Federation, um, who um, monitored this athlete in um, she we were at Sheffield, in an international event, and then at Rome. And um, on the basis of this, they then went, performed a study to see, well, what's happening? Does he have this big advantage? Should he be allowed to run? And to do that, you, we, essentially, they did lots of different things. I'm going to focus on this one thing, and it's about looking at how much energy the athlete uses when they're running. And um, in the world of sports science, it's quite a classic test. We essentially measure the oxygen uptake of the, um, of the athlete. And um, the more oxygen you breathe, that means the more energy you're using. The way the human body works, it's like oxygen is our fuel, really, when we're running. And, um, and so they, they did this study. They also looked at the, um, the, 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 the biomechanics and the, um, the impact forces as well and compared them against um, non-disabled runners to see what was happening, what were the differences. Um, so just, I'll just quickly sort of run you through some of the data, some of the findings. And... Um, the blue line here, this, this is what happens um, to normal, non-disabled well, non runners, non-disabled 400 meter runners. This is their oxygen uptake. It's, um, it's sort of normalized to the body mass. So sort of um, yeah, milliliters per minute per kilogram. And um, this is what Oscar Pistorius does. Um, they found that, and when they measured it in during race speed, he, he, essentially uses 25% less oxygen when he does the 400 metres. Now, in energy terms, therefore, he's got quite a significant advantage over a non-disabled runner. He uses less, less energy. Um, it's, it is actually a little bit more complicated than that, unfortunately, because what happens when we run, we have two components to our, our, our energy system. We have um, these two halves that it's called aerobic energy and anaerobic energy. The aerobic energy is the energy we breathe, so oxygen that we're breathing. So what the, that study showed was that he was breathing less. His, his aerobic energy demand was lower, but they couldn't measure his anaerobic demand. So in a norm, normally in a 400 meter race, about 60% of the energy comes from an anaerobic source. That's effectively uh, the oxygen that's already in our muscles. And you can use that very quickly when you're sprinting. Uh, but then you start, have to start breathing and you have to start using your aerobic system. 
Um, so so, so what, 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 the, what this study showed is that the, his energy demand from, from this, his aerobics source, dropped 25%. So he dropped down from 40 to basically 30. So the question is, what, what made up the remainder? And um, essentially there's three, there's three options really. Um, if he uses the same amount of energy overall, he can ha use more aerobic energy. He, he has a unique physiology, which means he, he, has, he can use more sort of anaerobic energy than anybody else that's ever been measured. Now that's quite unlikely. So the more likely scenario is that maybe he uses less aerobic energy, but the same amount of anaerobic energy, which means that he has an energy saving overall. Or perhaps the most likely one, that as his aerobic energy demand goes down, so his anaerobic energy demand. They both go down in proportion. That's kind of the finding. Well, it's, it's fairly unequivocal that he has a pretty big advantage. Um, particularly then when you look at things like this. Um, if you look at ground reaction forces, this is a typical ground reaction force. You've got uh, a non-disabled ground reaction force here, okay, and, and there. Those two lines there, there, then they're the, they're the sort of non-disabled, non, non non-ground non reaction forces from people that aren't using prosthetics. Uh, and you look at the Pistorus ground reaction force, it's, it's lower. Uh, he can't generate the same ground reaction force. And that's because he, he can't actually push off the floor. When, when we contract our, our the, the sort of the push-off phase when you're running, when you contract your calf muscle, that creates a ground reaction force. That's actually quite good if you're sprinting. So perhaps he, he, he loses out with the ground reaction force, but um, you look at the braking force, he hardly has any braking force because of, it's because of the shape of the prosthetic. Um, so there's, like a, there's, like, there's this force data, then there's the energy data, and they both seem to show that he has, a, he has an advantage. What should happen then is kind of up to, um, effectively, the, the, the regulatory bodies. Um, you know, on one hand, you might say, well, he shouldn't run because he's got a clear advantage. On the other hand, we create advantage for British cyclists and British bobsleigh athletes, uh, using similar sorts of ideas. We, we enhance people's performance the whole time in sports. It's what the whole business of sports science is. Um, you know, all these sports science departments in your universities, this is what they do. They create advantage by using science. So, um, so if you're going to ban him, well, maybe we should ban lots of other things as well. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a bit of a Pandora's box, to be honest with you. Um, I think what's certainly true is this is the... And the, 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 the prosthetics are fair, still fairly rudimentary. Um, I think you know you can only imagine where these things might go in 50 years, 100 years' time. But you have to remember, remember that the, the original um, ancient Olympics lasted for 300 years. I think we're only 100 years into ours. So um, you know where might things go to um, if, we, if we don't keep an eye on things? Um, and I guess what I'm coming around to say really is that this this could be the future. Um, uh, to date, most prosthetic technology has been fairly passive. And that's in the sense that it, it uses the um, energy that's put in by the athlete or by the user. Um, but really there's sort of a new wave of, of prostheses that are coming along which are active. They have their own internal energy supplies um, and add energy to the system. Um, the, the example there on the left hand side is um, a powered ankle joint um, developed in MIT by Hugh Hare. And on the right, that's the touch of its hand. Um, neither of these are used for sport yet, um, and they're still quite sort of experimental, really. Uh, I'll show you, this is, this is a powered ankle joint working, and um, the, 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 um, the main researcher here, Hugh Hare, he's sort of on record saying that you know, he, he wants to create the, the powered prosthetic that's going to run faster than Usain Bolt. You know, this is, this is where they, what they want to do. They, want to, they don't want to just correct any um, disability you want, might have. They want to enhance, move beyond. Um, the question is, you know, do you want to do that? Or is our, is our sort of idea of what is normal, are we actually trying to restrain people by trying to say, no, no, you can't do that, so that's not right. So there's all sorts of interesting sort of issues to tackle here. Um, I think that's probably what I'm going to say, to say that it's, um, it's a fascinating area, and, and engineering certainly has, has really shaped the sporting world. Uh, and certainly had huge impacts in, in the Paralympics. I guess the, 
the question is, um, you know, where do we want it to go in the future? And this is something that um, the Royal Academy of Engineering are very interested in as well, that they've, they've supported me through their public engagement fellowship to actually try to stimulate a bit of debate about, about these issues. Because um, I think, as, as, the, as you know, as sort of the decades roll on, I think we want to know, maybe try and understand a bit better what, what impact we want to see, or what impact we want, to have, we want engineering to have on our sport, and how do we want to control it. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent talk. That was very interesting. Um, you raised a very valid point about the, uh, the, the, the limitations of the human body versus the regulatory, the regulatory bodies that look at uh, limiting performance. I mean, the uh, classic, classic example is the shark skin suits uh, and the uh, javelin, the, the reshaping of the javelin to stop athletes throwing it out of the, uh, uh, out of the court, essentially. Um, but I, I, I hark back to a paper that was written, I think, last year after Usain Bolt's um, uh, run to uh, essentially model the uh, speed of the perfect human. I think it was Stanford University uh, was looking at, I think, 9.5 seconds uh, as, as, as a perfect athlete and, and that would be the limitations but from my point of view I'm, I think that anybody who sets a goal like that is just opening themselves up to be beaten right so the athletes are going to go out like, how valid do you think that research is to actually put a, a limiting factor on what the perfect human being could potentially achieve in, in any sport and do you think you could then if you do think it's valid do you think you could apply it to uh, regulatory, regulatory bodies Okay, I guess the, the question is, what are the ultimate limits? People always want to know this, you know, how fast can we run? How high can we jump? And um, I'd say we're, we're a long way off it, yeah. The, the, um, one of my, it's great, my, my, my PhD student has been doing a big sort of historical analysis of all the performance data uh, kind of imaginable from every kind of running event that's ever happened, sort of trying to see these trends and see where does this asymptote, where are we going to level off? Where is it going to be impossible for us humans to move, move quicker? And I think, you know, I don't know, 9.5 seconds, it sounds pretty fast. Um, the, the, the issue, though, is you, you have to look at other, if you look at other species, okay, well, I tell you, a greyhound moves an awful lot quicker than um, sort of a mongrel, and a racehorse goes an awful lot quicker than a pony. And um, I think, you know, you have to look, where are we in our evolution as humans? Um, are, are we optimised? Have we reached this, this point where we're not going to evolve any further? and get any better? I don't, I don't know. And certainly, you know, um, whether you like it or not, uh, you know, gene doping is perhaps on the horizon for uh, people like, certainly like um, WADA, the, the World anti doping Agency, they're thinking about gene doping. So potentially, could we see genetically modified athletes in the future? You know, and the whole idea of 9.5 seconds, it would be a joke to them. You know, they could be moving an awful lot quicker. Um, so, so, yeah, I don't know. There's, there's some very interesting in things to happen in, in the future. Um, but in terms of where are the ultimate limits and have we re or when will we reach them, I think, I think you're, you have to be quite arrogant to suggest that we are it. We have landed, we have arrived, we know everything there is to know and you know, we can go no further. I think that's a very arrogant position to take. Well, good afternoon everybody. As, as John says, uh, my role is with the Olympic Park uh, Legacy Company. And um, I'll start by giving you the conclusion, which I was told once is what you should do when you make a presentation. And there are two points I want to make. The first is that legacy is a long-term business. The regeneration of this bit of London, which in turn will help the UK uh, perform better, is something that has a 25 to 30 year time frame. However, John's reference to 2020 is also extremely valid because in the first five years after the Games, you can do a great deal to put the right uh, preconditions in place that legacy to work, to future-proof effectively uh, the decisions that, that you make at the start. So the, I'd like you to bear that in mind as I go through um, basically what the company is, what its task is, which effectively is to uh, create a new bit of the city of London from the Olympic uh, legacy and how we're going to go about doing that. Um, the company is a not-for-profit company, a public company. Um, set up by the mayor and the government and we're, its responsibility is really for the, the long-term planning, development, management and maintenance of the Olympic Park and its facilities after the London 2012 Games. And one of the themes you'll, you'll notice in my presentation 
is that uh, we have an incredible uh, array of assets to use. So the first big thing we've got to do is parlay those assets uh, into private sector investment. We've got to leverage them effectively. And I think um, post-budget and post the, the, the current state of the country's um, finances are in, I think generally there'll be a lot of public assets utilised trying to leverage uh, private sector money, private sector investment to get development, to get delivery, to get things done. And the other crucial thing we'll do at this stage is to set the standards. So, um, you know, a lot of what we do is positioning the future, is making sure that the, you know, the, the construction, the urban design, the sustainability standards are all uh, realistic, that, that the market can react to them, but they, are, they are, will actually achieve what we need them to achieve. To achieve. The remit of the company is quite an unusual beast. It's, it's, it's not really a, a single regeneration company. It's, it's in the conventional sense. It's a regeneration company, a master developer, a park manager, and a venues and facilities operator. So all these things you see up on the screen are all things that we'll end up doing or working with the private sector to do. So I'm just going, I'm just going the wrong way. But... The very, very good news, from my perspective, and I'm a property bloke through and through, been in it for 25 years, is the opportunity, which is frankly fantastic. Um, the, 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 the site, over 4 million people live within a 45-minute drive of the Olympic Park. 27.2 million footfall through Stratford Regional Station every year. Uh, five major universities within five miles of the park. And something that's been touched on, but, but hasn't already been said, and, uh, firstly, related to what Hugh was saying, incredible transport infrastructure. I mean, I'm one of the luckiest men in the country in the sense of having a regeneration job with adequate transport infrastructure there from the get-go. Very rarely happens, let me tell you. So that's fantastic. The other thing that's absolutely fantastic is the Westfield Shopping Centre. 1.9 square feet of retail space, 300 shops, opening October next year, 2011, so well before games. And, and, you know, we all know in our own personal lives how much of a, an anchor uh, a, a big shopping centre, how much usage, how much visitor at attractiveness that generates. When you start thinking about how you can link, you know, a visit to the shopping centre with going to see something in the stadium or one of the other venues, there's incredible cross-fertilisation um, to be taken advantage of there. So in order to, to utilise that opportunity, these are the assets uh, we've got. There's a total land holding on the park of about 281 hectares, not all of which my company own, I should hasten to add. Westfield owned a big chunk, the ODA owns a big chunk, British Waterways own a chunk, land and London and Continental Railways own some. So I'm not saying we've got control of the whole land, and there's a lot of working in partnership to be done. But, it, but it, just while I've been here this afternoon, various of these things have been mentioned, the press centre, the broadcast centre, the velo park, the football, the stadium, the aquatics, 250 metre swimming pools. And I think the, 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 the legacy of the Games is of course physical and of course economic. Um, I think the interesting call is how psychological it is. Um, if, if it goes well and, and UK wins lots of medals, well that's clearly a good thing. But from the perspective of, of you know, a 10-year-old kid living in Newham or Tower Hamlets, how big a deal is it to be able to go and, and run round the athletics track that Usain Bolt ran round, or to go for a swim in the pool that so-and-so won the gold medal in, or you know, in the football context to go and play on the same turf where one of their heroes um, played football. So it's, it's that sort of goodwill thing. There's, there's, there's a lot of talk in, in, in regeneration terms about the lack of role models for young people coming through today in deprived areas in, in places like the East End of London. And I think it's a very interesting debate as to how you can uh, potentially use some of that to, um, uh, you know, the goodwill factor or the halo effect it's sometimes called, how you harness that. And then just draw your attention to the, the, the four things um, bottom right of that uh, screen. The orbit is the mayoral structure, tallest sculpture in, in Europe, but a big visitor attraction. But the Westfield development I've spoken to, but equally, new homes in the Athletes' Village, some 3,000 new homes immediately after the Games 
going to be transformed, converted, and, and, and put onto the marketplace, and the transport connection. So effectively, those four items are the legacy already there. That's the beginnings of the legacy. And that's the way we, and I think generally the world needs to think about it. The, the, the one thing the government has done very well, I think, is to think about the future, and like a lot of other uh, cities in Olympic Games terms. So I, I'm absolutely not going to fall into the trap of underestimating the benefit of having live working projects on, on their day one. Now our goals are these. Um, some of them you would say, well, it's motherhood and apple pie, of course we're going to be doing all this stuff. But the two things I want to draw to your attention is, in that third bullet point, the word convergence at the end means convergence to the London, the average London standard, skills, jobs, health, educational attainment, that sort of stuff. At the moment, the area around the Olympic Park is lagging well behind in all four of those indicators. So that's uh, a, a real life task we, we, we need to deliver. And then the penultimate one, the fifth one, Centre of Economic Innovation. I think the, um, there's a very big call to be made about how you can uh, utilise research, higher education, world leading universities, cutting edge technology, the sort of thing David was just talking about. Um, but can you turn that into real live jobs at all levels, at all skill levels? Um, because the one thing we've got to do with the Olympic Park is to make sure it's connected, not just physically, but also economically and socially. Um, it, all of that is, is absolutely critical to achieving a successful um, legacy. And, and in furtherance of that, that aim, everything, every sort of project we're going to look at will be trying to deliver against all or at least three of these tasks, these goals, these principles, whatever you want to call them. And, you know, I'll just, I'll just run through them a little bit. But the, the creating a destination um, is both at a local level, so the northern bit of the... Um, Olympic site is what you and I would recognise as a more conventional park, lots of greenery, um, river running through it, lots of trees. And that's likely, I think, to be locally used, regionally used, and, and more crucially, regular, regular daily usage. That's where, you know, mum takes her kids in the pram for a, a, a walk during the day. That's, that's a great opportunity to integrate with the existing communities around the Olympic um, uh, Park site. Um, so, you know, don't underestimate the power of, of green space in that connection. And then you've got these, these much more sort of physical activities. With the, the Velo Park encompasses not only the, the, the Velodrome with its circuit, but also road circuit, mountain biking, BMX, all good stuff for, for any age these days. The extreme sports, um, these are areas, one, one of the interesting things is, is that the, the Olympic Park has room uh, to develop anywhere up to about 10,000 houses and employment space for anything up to 10,000 jobs. But they won't all happen on day one. And we've actually got more land earmarked for development than we have park. So what am I going to do with uh, a development site that isn't going to be developed for 15 years? well, I'm going to find some interim uses. And there might well be things like this. There might be festivals, there might be farmers' markets, concerts, all that sort of stuff. So that, that, the jargon tends to be animation, animating the park, you'll hear people say. But a lot of it is all driven by the desire to make it a, a well-loved place, somewhere that people go to and want to come back to. And that's what I mean about the local regional thing. Parks work very well um, when... Their repeat business isn't just reliant on international stroke tourist things. Their repeat business comes from local and regional. Ideally, if we get it right, you've got all three categories coming to the Olympic Park. International, national, local and regional. It's four, isn't it? But um, you know the, the, the point I'm making, the tourists and the locals. Then the second principle I spoke about was connecting the site. And I haven't found a way of, of making this slide interesting, to be blunt. <laughs> It is just simply to, to show the network of road, waterway, cycle, 
footpath connections, the physical connections, which is, a, is an incredible important part, but also, so is the last bullet point you see there, the social infrastructure, by which we mean schools, health centres, community centres, that sort of thing. Schools are an incredibly good way of integrating communities because, you know, at a primary school level, one of the best ways of getting to know the people who live nearby you is to, to be chatting as you're dropping your kids off at school. You know, they're really important sort of regeneration factor. They also, at a secondary school level, actually, they also have an incredible um, market appeal. They, they, they help make a place very attractive to build new housing. And the, the, the housing neighbourhoods um, I want to talk about here, some of the slides didn't come out, unfortunately, on that one, but the, the key point, I think, is that what we're aiming to do is include a lot of family housing in conventional houses, so two-storey, three-storey terraces, muse houses, townhouses. Um, you hear a lot in, in current property world of family housing, but they tend to mean three-bedroom flats, and there aren't actually that many house-buying members of the public who buy three-bedroom flats for their families. Most of us like houses. And family housing tends to help you create a balanced, stable community, which is what we're after. So the mix of housing type, I think, will, you know, for very pra the very pragmatic reason of it gives us a market differentiator from the high-density apartments that um, will, all, will be in the Athletes' Village, but are also at the bottom of that slide down Stratford High Street, and we've all seen go up in, in London um, over the last sort of decade or so. So the, the, the family housing idea both is, is very helpful in regeneration terms, but it's also very helpful in, in you know, being complementary to the other market activity that, that's going on at the moment. And this is just really to talk, give you a sense of what I've just said, you know, conventional houses, houses with front doors on streets, um, you know, local hierarchy of streets, so you can, you can work out where you are, that, that sense of leg legibility and identity, access to small local squares and community centres. You know, but some, some quite sexy stuff, frontages onto the main parks, really good quality, four bedroom homes, you know, in great locations, there's a sort of stadium in the distance, but park immediately in front of you, great place to live. And then building on what I was talking about, about the interim uses of areas, but also making sure that what we do do isn't just about big events. It is about family scale events, family areas, places for people to go. Harking back to what I was saying about kids being able to go where their idols have been and, and that sort of idea. Some, some good quality, um, you know, it is uh, a stunning bit of... London, or it will be a stunning bit of London after the Games, so there's some very iconic structures going to be built and we do need to make sure that all the um, urban landscaping that goes around those uh, is worthy of that. And then the third, uh, third major principle is, is jobs and training and here um, I hope John will forgive me if I say that effectively we're going to um, nick one of the ODA's brilliant ideas and, and just keep doing it, but the it's the second two bullet points that you see there, is using the, the, the labour forecasting to influence the local training provision. It's something the ODA have done brilliantly, absolutely fantastic. And um, you know, we certainly don't want to be reinventing that particular wheel. And I think it's the, you know, that, that we do, we've learnt actually in, in the, the recent property downturn that regeneration only really works if it's underpinned by jobs. You can't really underpin it with high density apartments selling off plan and not being lived in you know you've got some quite superficial frothy value going in there but it's it's not real and it's not it's not lasting the jobs is the key thing and, and that i think is a, is a very big point we 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 work my own company won't deliver all the jobs there's a lot of um, employment space to go as part of the uh, stratford city development and with um, westfield london continental railways but we can we, our job i think is to um, help them uh, corral all the various funding streams that go into jobs and training and make sure that any developer, any investor who comes in there is met with a, a, just a one-stop shop. He, you know, he'll get a planning permission. It'll say, in, in his 106 agreement, it'll say, make sure you do local jobs and training. 
And all he's got to do is pick up the phone to the given person. Yep, yeah, that, that's how you do it. Boom, boom. So I think it's a, a, a real brokerage thing. That's probably too too um, detailed for you to read. And um, the, the fourth principle uh, you'll recall, with, or this is the fifth principle, sorry, was um, ensuring sustainability. Um, and it's really the, the categories you would expect, water, energy, waste, climate change, adaptation. Um, the goals are, uh, you know, in, in the housing context, uh, code for sustainable homes level six in both water and energy, minimised waste, looking at waste to power, gasification, the various things that many of you in the room will be um, familiar about. Um, but from our perspective, the trick is to ensure that they're embedded from day one. This is one of my five, first five-year points. We've got to make sure that these goals are embedded in all the development briefs, all the disposal documents that go out to the market, and that there is a clear delivery plan. We, we, we've, we're holding the ring, if you like, of a clear delivery plan, how it all fits together. Um, and I think that's very important. Um, three phases of delivery in, in the immediate sense. The... Um, first of those is the, the planning side of it, if you like, sort of 2010, 2011, planning, preparation and promotion. Uh, speaking to you as a regeneration professional, I have to say that having a year or two to plan and prepare is an incredible luxury. That's, that's really good news. Um, and then working very closely, well, during that period also, working with partners very, very closely, such as, as, as the ODA, in terms of the, the transformation works there doing, moving into 2012, 2013, and then post-2013, 14, up to about 2018, is the first phase of uh, activation regeneration, as it says there. So that means, I think, when the park opens after the games, you don't see any hoardings. The public goes in, and all right, if somebody's doing some work on the stadium or the athletes' village, fair enough, you have to have a health and safety type hoarding there. But elsewhere, if a site's not being developed for some years, it's not hoarded off. It's open, it's got a use on it, or it's, at, at worst you can run on it and kick a ball about or something. So I think there's a big, big point there about making sure that, you know, what people go into the park as soon as they can afterwards, and they immediately get a very good uh, experience. And then finally, my final slide is, is really just to give you a sense of what could happen in the first five years, what will happen in the first five years. Uh, the first point up there, build family housing, I think I've already uh, explained about the, the, the logic behind that. The second point, the creating the signature urban park. The North Park, as I said, very much about softer play, green space, the Olympic Plaza around the stadium, um, much more of a destination, that's where Orbit is, that's where the big visitor attractions will be, the big sort of... Um, employment close to Stratford City, close to the retail. Um, the waterways is, is something we really should be taking advantage of. I think we need to work quite hard around that. Employment for us is the um, International Broadcast Centre uh, and the Media Press Centre, north, top, top left of that plan, the northwest of the site. As I say though, there's a lot of other employment generating uh, activities elsewhere. Connectivity I've spoken about, sustainability I've spoken about, and sports, really making sure that the venues, I mean, the, 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 there's a sort of baseline, I suppose, which is you, do, you don't do an Athens, you don't just put padlock the venues. But it's got to be a lot more than that. I mean, we, we really have got to perform a lot better than that. So, uh, for example, we've already been soft market testing the market uh, for future stadium users. We've asked people to put expressions of interest forward. Um, you know, and I think... It's very helpful indeed if we can get to the point of uh, selecting somebody who is going to take on the stadium post-games um, as early as possible, possibly by the end of this year, so that everybody knows where they stand, everybody knows what the after-use is going to be, and, and you move through on that basis. So, finally, just leave you with a, a, uh, you know, an o overall shot, but... Never before, to my knowledge, has a host city been in this position where it's put in place the legacy company, the vehicle that's going to deliver the legacy um, three years before the Games. Um, as I say, the two points I'd like to come back to is the transformation, the legacy, won't happen overnight. It'll take many, many years. And so it should. 
you do it too quickly, you'll get it wrong because some of it you can't do yourself. Some of it has to grow and evolve organically. So we put in place the, re the preconditions, the master plans, the frameworks that are flexible enough to react to different circumstances, different market circumstances, different funding circumstances, but set out the key principles and stick with those, particularly around things like uh, sustainability. And at the end of the day, our task and the legacy is a new piece of city. It's, it's a new quarter in London. Thank you very much. Keith Robinson, um, I guess my question um, is aimed at, at Duncan. Um, I was at a presentation not so very long ago uh, on the Olympics, um, and there was a speaker there who talked about development post the Olympics, but the emphasis was very much on housing. And one of my colleagues picked him up on that and said, what about manufacturing facilities and engineering? And the chairman of the conference happened to be the chief executive of one of the uh, London boroughs who responded by saying, well, we don't want manufacturing, we don't want engineering. So I'm kind of on your theme that regeneration is only going to happen if there are, in fact, jobs to make this sustainable. So could you reassure us that uh, manufacturing and engineering aren't written out of the agenda and you'll do something to actually educate politicians to avoid social engineering? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure I can commit to uh, educating politicians. I'm not sure I've got that, that amount of time left in, in my career. But the um, yes is the short answer. We can, I can reassure you very firmly indeed that uh, highly skilled uh, industry areas such as engineering are extremely welcome. I think it's an interesting debate to be had about can you accommodate the full spectrum on the Olympic part site from the, the sort of research end of things through to the, for want of a better phrase, the metal bashing end of things. Um, and I think you probably can. I think you need to choose the locations well, as you would with any uh, economic development um, investment. But in terms of uh, breadth of industry, breadth of uh, skill, uh, you know, we, we haven't, we, we're absolutely not going down the road of saying, well, we only want creative media type industries that, 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 you know, there might well be uh, a drive to locate some media industries around where the press um, setup is and the broadcast centre is. But generally, um, for me, I have to say it's as, it's as much about the skills and training offer as it is about the jobs that, that, that follow. So, you know, the simple answer to your question is, is I, I, I absolutely categorically reassure you that, that we're not ruling out manufacturing or engineering. Having said that um, you wouldn't deter it, could you say something about your plans for actively in, um, encouraging inward investment and in overseas manufacturers? Because uh, London has a legacy of manufacturing. It used to be an industrial centre in its own right. Um, it has you know, huge poverty. Uh, and I'm just trying to connect the, connect the two together because you've got a willing workforce with at least some skills there, so I wonder if you can match those up, or tell us how you intend to match them up. Well, I mean, there's t I think there's two points to make there. One is, firstly, that um, clearly we'll be working very closely with the five host boroughs and with the GLA and the Mayor, so the inward investment offer, I think, as you rightly identify, is an international one. Can you use the profile of the Olympic Park to secure that investment? Do I mind whether that investment goes into the park or elsewhere into Hackney or Newham or Tower Hamlets? No, I don't, so long as that bit of London gets hold of it and that bit of London benefits from the job. So I think, I think, we, I think it's a broader question than just the Olympic Park. Um, some of you may have read that um, uh, the Mayor of London is, is keen to sort of morph the com my company into a mayoral development corporation. Um, and that of itself, I think, would be a, quite a useful um, tool to help with inward investment. Um, so, uh, you know, we, the offer we're going to make is, is very much about the skills and training side of things, the brokerage side of things. Uh, we'll rely very heavily on the Mayor of London and the host boroughs teams to help us with that because we can't deliver that on our own. 
But I think the way to think about the inward investment offer is, it, is that it, the Olympic Park is, is part of the wider five host borough offer, which in turn is part of the wider London offer, which in turn is part of the wider UK offer, I suppose. You'll recall the Docklands Redevelopment Corporation, and uh, I think you know, there has been some discussion about whether that sort of model could work here, both within the park and on a wider uh, on a wider basis. Um, certainly, last week I was with Robin Wales, who's the mayor of uh, of Newham, and because uh, a lot of the park actually is in in Newham, although we talk about the four boroughs, the bulk of the park is actually in Newham, and uh, Robin has got certainly got some. Uh, big ideas about seeing the, the Olympic Park as being the start of a, a redevelopment right the way down um, through to uh, where City Airport is, for, it, for example. And uh, I mean, it's not public, generally very well known, but Siemens, um, the German engineering company, have just announced in the last uh, couple of weeks that they're going to create a, a research centre in Newham um, down towards the, the airport end of the site with um, potential three or 400 people being em employed in it and they're going to have it built and up and running before the Games, which, uh, again, has had a lot of support from the Mayor, as you might imagine, but um, it's encouraging that companies of that scale are looking at this part of London rather than traditionally always heading out to the west, but looking to the east end of London for that sort of facility. There was another question on the other side, did I see Chris Lawn uh, from Queen Mary, which is just uh, two miles to the uh, the west. Uh, it's a comment, really, that um, just off your map, to the west of the North Park, is uh, Victoria Park, one of London's best kept secrets. A very big open green area, and just to the north is uh, Hackney Marshes, which I think has the highest concentration of football pitches in Europe. Um, we're not actually stuck for green spaces. I mean, I think. I think the North Park is a, is a wonderful idea, but uh, is it a completely, is it a step change for this part of London? They actually have quite a lot of green space already. Uh, it's a comment more than a question, I think. Well, I, 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 and it's a perfectly valid comment. I, I think my answer would be um, that the, the size of the North Park, which is broadly speaking about the size of St. James's Park, something like that, fits very well into those two, the, the two categories you've just spoken about. And we think of it as, as being all being part of the 26 mile long Lee Valley Park, which, which comes all the way down. So I think you're absolutely right to, to put it into context. For myself, I think it, I think it fits very well in, in that context. Um, maybe I overemphasize the, oh, what's the right phrase, the passive leisure use of the park. I mean, I think, I think the, you know, Victoria Park is used for concerts and things, I was going to say very occasionally, but occasionally th through the year. The North Park and the Olympic uh, site will be used not so much for concerts, but for much smaller scale events, much, much more regularly than that. So uh, I probably overemphasised the fact, I, I didn't mean to imply that there won't be any events or, or, or any sort of um, activity like that going on in the North Park, there will. So it's actually quite a useful um, it's not quite a missing bit of the jigsaw, but it fits quite well in the jigsaw of, of, of scale of, of green space, if you like. Well, while I've got the mic, perhaps I could ask a question. Uh, there has been some uh, talk in the press recently of uh, the waterway development not really taking place in the way that was intended. Uh, could we have a, an authoritative comment on this, please? <laughs> well, seeing as I... I'm going to answer that one because I was getting the stick from British Waterways Board um, uh, over the, the, the Times and uh, coverage. This was um, primarily cover, this was really comment on the fact that we built a new lock at the mouth of the Lee, um, which um, enables the, the River Lee to be, um, uh, to be maintained, um, obviously, in order to have navigable, uh, uh, to become a navigable waterway. And the idea was that, or uh, well, the hope was, that it would be used extensively during the Games construction uh, by barges bringing materials to the site. Um, that has proved quite difficult to actually get going. Um, what we are finding it's being used for is removal of waste from site, and that's because you've got the Thames already being used 
uh, to ca carry a lot of London's waste down to the uh, waste treatment plants down to in, in Essex and Kent. And so uh, we're now shipping out about 1,000 tonnes a week of construction waste material um, in containers down through using barges, using the river, using the River Lee. But I think, uh, and the point that um, British Waterways Board would make is that the, the building of the lock, which was a 20 million pound investment, so the comment was, you know, you spent 20 million and it's not being used during the construction period. This was a very long term investment, and in fact, what we're doing. What you're doing by putting that lock in is you're you're creating uh, flood uh, flood control mechanisms on the River Lee. You're creating the ability for the Lee to be used for leisure in a different way to that which it has, um, certainly up through the park for the next uh, hundred years. Um, and you are indeed creating the opportunities for potential future um, freight use or or, or other. Um, business uses of, of the river. So this wasn't sort of seen as being 20 million which was going to give us two years worth of construction material barges. This was an investment for, for very much the long term. And certainly during the games itself, I talked to her at the beginning of today about 3,000 tonnes of material going on and off. The, three, the, the, the waste materials during the games we expect to take pretty well wholly off um, down uh, down the river in barges because again we're linking into that uh, into that facility. A lot of attention is also being given to the biodiversity of all of this, of course. And uh, I mean the Lee um, now is a, is a lot cleaner. We've done a lot of transformation of habitats. We're, we're creating new habitats. We're planting about half a million wetland plants alongside the the river as part of this. So. The, the, the habitat which will be left um, at the end of the games will certainly be uh, a lot, lot better than the one which was there in the uh, future. I think the river actually will become very much almost a focal point um, during the games in the same way as the Thames is a focal point for, for London. I think we're very fortunate with this Olympics to have this broad stretch of river running right the way through the, through the middle of the park. And the, the discussion goes on all the time about how do we maximise, optimise the use of the, the river during the games. Um, we tend to run into the security people occasionally on this sort of issue. As you, we run into the security people everywhere we go, of course, but uh, uh, you can imagine that they have certain nervousness about uh, the river and what, what potentially it could be used for um, in a terrorist sense. But, uh, there was another question, I think, about to pop up. Yes. I may have missed this. Did you mention when the signage, road signs, would be all, uh, changed? Can't happen overnight, can it? No. Um, <laughs> the signage for the road networks and the general wayfinding signage across London, big for the pedestrians as well as road traffic users, will start in the early summer of 2012 uh, because you need to get that in well in place, the temporary overlays, where the live sites are going to be. So it's going to be a longish process of putting the stuff up and then, then taking it down afterwards. Uh, to minimise dis dis disruption. To, to Hugh on the transport network, I think you mentioned briefly that it was a, a dynamic or smart network you could adapt and change to the needs of the situation at a particular time. Um, so I was just wondering, in addition to the actual transport, transport links themselves, what kind of additional infrastructure is there in place to sense and detect what sort of transport there is out there and, and control that? One of the things we will be using is, um, for example, the games, the fleets of vehicles that will be moving the athletes around, for example, will be wired up because we need to track their capability to understand whether we're doing road speeds necessary in each of the sections. Um, similarly, we're going to be tracking um, gate data usage off the underground to try and understand how that's thing. Because the real trick in this thing is to start to try and understand trends early enough in the piece so you can then start to do different things as a consequence of the above. Um, so I think we'll be using quite a lot of that. The other thing we will be using is that when the tickets actually go on sale themselves, it's at that point that we'll understand fairly clearly where people are likely to be travelling to and from. So rather than taking the initial demand model which we created say four years ago, the very, very minor tweaked version that we've now got of the ticket pre-registration, you then get the ticket sales data itself and then you've got the real time actual loading systems themselves. So there will be a lot of work uh, to, to tweak at the margin at that basis.
David Anderson again. This, this brings a, a, a thought. Uh, I mean, is the sale of transport tickets going to be integrated with the, the sale of the actual Olympic event tickets? The short answer to your question is yes. The more broader answer is that what we want to do is we want to sell the overall transport proposition as part of the actual sports event itself. We want to do something different as far as the customer is concerned. So not only will we be given a choice around mode, whether you're heavy rail, direct coach, park and ride or what have you, but we'll provide you with a special games journey planner, which will help you plan your journey itself, provide you matrices which allow you to work out which multiple sports you can do on a particular day. Your sports ticket itself will come bundled with free travel within the context of London itself to encourage you to use public transport. Um, we'll adjust the train's patterns themselves, the duration of service, all designed to try and encourage people into public transport for our own purposes, but also then leave behind a legacy of even higher public transport usage. And one of the things that London's experienced over the last decade is a growth in public transport usage from something like 44, so 40 percent of trips to something like 44 percent of trips last time I year. Look, we want to continue that path through, again, also supporting walking and cycling. So those are the sorts of things we're going to be doing in terms of trying to encourage people to use public transport, plan better, and then provide real-time information to them. Any more? No? Well, that's perfect timing. Um, put it to my watch, it's two minutes to six. Um, I, I hope you found this afternoon uh, useful uh, and informative, because that was the purpose, was that it was a, a, a briefing uh, session. Uh, I mean, clearly, engineers are absolutely woven through uh, everything to do with the Olympics. Um, Right from uh, in, in every, uh, every every single aspect. And I suppose we shouldn't really be too surprised by that because I constantly go around reminding people about how pretty well the whole of civilization and the way we live our lives is supported by by engineering. So the fact that the Olympics is supported by by engineering is is perhaps no different. What the what I think the Olympics are is an opportunity because of the interest that we're seeing in the Olympics is to actually use it as a vehicle for, in, in, in a sense, enlightening people uh, to just the role of engineers and the excitement that, uh, of being an engineer and the sort of things which engineers um, uh, create and, and can achieve. And of course what we've also got, I think, here, we're very fortunate, we've got a big budget uh, and therefore we've been able to do things to a very high standard, uh, which I think has been important. We're breaking ground um, in the sustainability agenda uh, to a very high degree and one of the things which we're doing at the ODA is we, we've already set in train the, uh, if you like, the knowledge gathering to give us the knowledge transfer um, going forward. So there is uh, already a team set up which is now working with each of the projects, with the designers, with the contractors and, and so on to ensure that uh, for each element of the development we've actually got at the end of it uh, a package of, of uh, knowledge which we can take forward and, and use on other, on other projects. Mention was made earlier on about public procurement. I think there will be a lot of lessons and discussion around the way in which the project's been managed the demands which have been put on the project, because um, from, as a public sector project, uh, we didn't insist, for example, that training should be done to a particular level. Um, by the end, by the time we got at the beginning, by the time we got to the end of our procurement process, we were actually writing into the contracts a percentage of trainees that we expected each contractor to to be employing, um, and that I think is the sort of thing which will be looked at going forward. The whole electronic database was created by the public sector for this project to bring um, suppliers and buyers to, together. Um, and that database is going to be available um, across the UK for all public sector bodies. So, uh, so hopefully that will create a further form of, of legacy um, going, going forward. But fundamentally, um, a fantastic engineering opportunity. A lot of engineers having an enormous amount of fun, as you've seen today. Um, some of the most exciting things which people will ever have the opportunity to do. And, uh, and I hope that you found it uh, interesting, enjoyable, and hopefully exciting 
and will go away a little bit more inspired as a consequence of uh, what's happening on the Olympics. So thank you very much and a final round of applause for our speakers.